Okay, hey everyone, we're about to get started um, once again. So maybe like me, you've ever tried to read a Haskell paper and on the second page you're just greeted by this mess of Greek letters and horizontal and vertical bars and you're like, what the hell is this stuff? So if that's the case, then this talk is pretty much perfect for you as uh, Andres is going to build up that understanding. Uh, he's from our partners at WellTyped, who's been long, long time supporters of ZuriHack. Um, so yeah, go ahead and get started. Thank you very much, Jasper. Uh, welcome, everyone. So I'm going to like, also encourage very much this, for this to be interactive. So don't hesitate to ask any questions you might have at any time. And I will also try to like follow Simon's, as usual, very good example from this morning to just repeat your question so that we don't have to run around with a microphone all the time uh, so that that's on the recording. Also, let me just say in advance, <clears throat> I have quite like a plan and I don't really know how long it will take to go through all of this, but it doesn't matter to me whether we're doing exactly what I prepared. So if your questions are taking me into a slightly different direction, it may be that I have to improvise some more, but that's okay. I think you yeah, like so don't don't hesitate to ask questions and I'll and to challenge me. <laughs> I'll try to uh, I'll try to answer. So um, very briefly about WellTyped, although most of that I've already said during the opening. So um, WellTyped is a Haskell consultancy company. We're around since 2008. We're by now about 20, and we have a wide variety of clients from very small to very large and um, also sort of from research and industry. And we focus very much as a company on GHC and tooling, um, uh, but we are also doing sort of just normal Haskell software development and consulting. And we're also doing training um, in the last few years, um, mostly remote, but before that also on site and perhaps that's also coming back. So we'll see. Um, and very briefly about me, I'm, uh, I'm using Haskell since, yeah, since about 1997. At that time, I was a, an undergraduate student of mathematics at the University of Konstanz in Germany, not too far from here, actually. Uh, and um, I've done a PhD in computer science at Utrecht University in the Netherlands, um, which was done in 2004. And uh, yeah, after that, I've been like at universities for, for a while. I've been doing a postdoc in Bonn. I have been visiting uh, uh, the Institute of Cybernetics in, in Estonia and Tallinn, um, and I've been briefly at Freiburg. But then I returned to Utrecht for a couple of years as a lecturer, and then I moved over to WellTyped since 2010. So that is after WellTyped was set up. But at the time when I joined, WellTyped had two people. <laughs> so it was a very small company back then. It's still small, but it like, uh, feels very different whether you have like three or four people in a company or 20. And I'm living in Regensburg, Germany these days. And um, I should say, um, before I forget this, that um, like if you want to learn more about the stuff that I'm talking about, then I would really recommend uh, Benjamin Pierce's Types and Programming Languages book. It's by now not very recent anymore, but I still think it's an excellent book. It's very accessible. It covers a lot of ground. It sort of on the surface is very easy to start, get started, and then it has stuff that goes very deep and very um, challenging exercises and problems. Um, but it's inspired. I mean, it's, I'm not directly following Pierce, so I have been... Um, like writing these slides without like looking at the book, more or less. <laughs> uh, in particular, that means that everything that is incorrect on these slides is definitely due to me and not um, <laughs> due to Benjamin. And, um, uh, and it, definitely there are many other sources about, about this, this kind of stuff, so um, uh, too many to, to mention. But um, uh, If you are interested in sort of the like even more formal or like say algorithmically formal side of things. Benjamin Pierce has also been working on the software foundation series, which allows you to like prove all this, not, not just like learn about all this stuff, but prove all this stuff correct in, in uh, a proof assistant such as Koch. 
then uh, that is also very nice, like uh, very nice to do. Um, so the plan for today is to just look at a succession of programming languages with like initially very few, like almost like so few that it's completely boring, and uh, and then more and more features. And we're going to discuss the type rules for these languages and also hopefully like learn how to read type rules and how to come up with them and and why perhaps why they're written like this or uh, how they how they should look like. Um, then we're also looking at evaluation from a sort of theoretical viewpoint, how like evaluation rules are usually being described in papers. And then we're going to discuss a few properties. I'm not going to prove anything in this uh, talk, but I'm like talking about certain properties that are desirable to have, and we can perhaps sketch how, how one would go about proving some of these. And, um, and we're going to look at sort of a very straightforward implementation of all these systems in Haskell. Right? Um, but um, but these, this is not a... This is basically a sort of presentation-focused implementation. It's not a very nice to use and also not a very efficient implementation. We can perhaps, again, we can sketch a little bit like what kind of things one would have to do differently if one wanted to have something that is more production-ready. Um, and um, as far as the language progression is concerned, we're going to start with something where we just have booleans and natural numbers, and then we're going to add variables Right? So we don't even have variables initially. So variables are like a big step. If we, if we can uh, give names to things and reuse them, that makes things uh, terribly complicated, actually. Um, and uh, then we are adding functions, and then we are at the level which is called simply typed lambda calculus, which is a very, very famous uh, type system, which is, um, but at the same time, very simple. And then we are going to add polymorphism, and then we're at system F. And system F is, I think, what Simon said this morning, GHC uses. But GHC uses actually, well, as we've also partially seen, uh, various extensions even of system F. So one can go one step further after system F comes system F omega. System F omega is actually, I think, what is sort of conceptually closest to GHC's core language, but where you have sort of the full kind system that, uh, that Haskell has. And then, on top of that, GHC then also adds constraints, um, these equality constraints, and so on and so forth. So I think that's called system FC in the literature, and there are all sorts of um, variations that I can't keep track of, like F and then, like, an arbitrary combination of symbols and letters. The <laughs> Probably somebody has written a paper about nearly all of them by now. What we will not do is, um, I mean, unless you push me very much into these directions, but even then probably we won't, it's safe to say that we won't really uh, get to uh, fully do something. Like, we're not really going to focus on type inference, so we're mostly going to look at type checking. So what's the difference in general between type checking and type inference? The idea of type checking is that you already know the type that your program is supposed to have, and you're only going to verify that the program indeed does have this type. And um, type inference is like if you just have a program and you're asking the system to figure out um, is there a valid type that this program can have. And um, Haskell and GHC obviously has a lot of like rather clever type inference machinery built in. And we're not going to look at that very much. Um, we are going to highlight the point where it really becomes important, though. I mean, like for the very simple languages, we have more or less almost type inference for free because they are so simple. But um, at some point, we're going to reach sort of the threshold where if we wanted to have proper type inference, we would have to start doing really hard work. And, um, we're also not going to talk about all sorts of Haskell-specific features, like type classes, which are very, very interesting from a type system perspective, but um, I don't think we'll have the time to go into them. We're not really going to talk about kinds, the step from F to F omega. Um, and as I said, we are not really going to 
look at an implementation that is particularly good either on the efficiency scale or the usability scale or also the type safety scale. I've been really trying to optimize the implementation for sort of uh, straightforwardness, but uh, that means that there are a couple of things that are actually tricky where it would be nice to have the, the help of the type system of Haskell's type system to get the implementation right, where I've been choosing um, to deviate from my, my normal mode of operation where I do as much as possible on the type level and to actually <laughs> restrain myself and um, do things in a uh, straightforward way. If you want to follow along, the, the slides and the code um, that is on these slides is all available. Um, and there are also some exercises, like if you want to work on um, like these kinds of things, um, not necessarily during the session, but after the session, some, some suggestions for what you could be trying to do. That's all available from this repository. And um, uh, the, I think the link is also in the and the advanced track um, types channel for, from, uh, of the Discord, if you, if you now can't um, type it in quickly enough. Uh, so, and there are five versions of the language that we're going to go through, um, and uh, they're, numbered, they're numbered here as well, so you can kind of associate the, the code files with the, uh, with the point in the, in the presentation where we're at. Right, so we're now starting to move towards version one of the language, which is very simple. But before we even start, we're going to start with just natural numbers to just give an overview of sort of how do things look in like really such a simple setting that it's almost useless. But, um, so, but just to introduce, so at the top we have a Haskell data type definition of piano style natural numbers, right? So, um, not efficient natural numbers that we can calculate with, but we just say a natural number is either zero, that's the first constructor, or the successor of another natural number, right? And then we can build any natural number by repeatedly applying the S constructor to Z. And if we want to write this, like, sort of as it would be written in a paper, then usually some form of um, BNF, um, Bacchus Nauer form, is being used to describe syntax. And um, that often looks somewhat like this. So we say there is a particular syntactic category which we denote using an n, like a, a meta variable n. And whenever in our theory we use a lowercase n, then it probably stands for a natural number. And that can be either um, the literal. Um, uh, constant zero, or it can be the syntactic construct S applied to another natural number. So one thing to keep in mind when we're talking about notation and syntax is that unlike a programming language, where there are clear rules for what's right and wrong, for like mathematical or theoretical notation, there are no such rules. Every author it has the freedom and will use the freedom in general <laughs> to somehow push their own preferences, right, by making subtle changes that are different from everyone else and say, oh, but I know better. And I'm no exception. <laughs> uh, I, I, I mean, that even happens subconsciously, right? I'm not trying to. Uh, deliberately do this, and, but it just happens because there is no, there's no type checker for what you're writing, there is no syntax checker for what you're writing, so people are just using uh, certain conventions and sooner or later they're deviating from what's normal. So there is no, there's no clear rule, so, right? And already in, 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 in simple things like this colon, colon equals for defining what a syntactical category is, that is a very commonly used symbol, but not everybody uses this. Some people are just using colon equals, others using a right arrow, um, and um, yet other things are possible, right? And similarly for, for nearly all the other things that we're seeing. And um, so that's the syntax. And now below, we have type rules. And the type rules are basically, that's usually a step beyond syntax, right? So, um, and then originally, I think this comes from the fact that simply certain things are very easy to, um, to write parsers for, right, conceptually. Like if you, if you want to 
if you if you have a string and you want to somehow turn that into into some more usable, more information uh, full um, internal representation, then you're typically writing a parser to parse the string into an abstract syntax tree. And certain things are very easy to do while parsing, and other things are very difficult to do while parsing. And uh, so typically you're describing the things that are easy to do while parsing in the syntax and the things that are not so easy to do while parsing in the type rules, which is supposed to be a separate step after parsing where you're saying, okay, I have a syntactically correct program, but now I want to see whether it's also type correct. And there you do such things such as checking whether variables are in scope or whether everything is used in the right way and so on and so forth. Now, for our simple language, the type system is really doing nothing because all the legal terms that we can form using the syntax have the type nut. And there is no way to write a type incorrect term. And how do we read such type rules? Well, type rules are typically written using such a horizontal bar, and then there is a conclusion below. Right. So the, the first line here says, um, zero is of type nat, and I'm, I'm using sort of, in this case, I'm deviating from Haskell syntax a bit, like almost all the literature on type theory is going to use a single colon for the has the type relation. Some people are using an element of symbol, but nearly everyone is using a single colon. And, uh, and Haskell, uh, I think, <laughs> I mean, personally, I'm not really opposed to it, but like when Haskell was designed, the designers were obviously thinking that lists are the most important thing in the world. There is nothing more important than lists. And therefore, the, the single colon should really be the cons operator and, and therefore use the double colon for the has the type um, thing. But that's something where Haskell is really different from like nearly all other functional programming languages as well. Like for example, standard ML and OCaml, they're using a single colon as well. I think Idris is using a single colon. I think Agda is using a single colon. Koch is using a single colon. Lean is using a single colon. So all, like, all the systems out there, you'll, you'll typically see this. Okay? And um, and then sometimes we have not just a conclusion, but also a precondition. So that we see this in the rule on the right, where we say the successor of n is a natural number if n is a natural number. Right? So um, if we have some, something on top and below the bar, then what's below is the conclusion that we can draw, validly draw, whenever um, the, the statement on the top is true. Okay? And one more thing I should probably highlight, even though it, 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 there are always these things that seem obvious, but they might not be, is that if I say the first rule says that a zero is a natural number, right? I'm kind of applying an interpretation to this already. Right? What I'm really doing here is I have a relation, a mathematical relation, between a syntactic term and a type, Right? And the interpretation that like, this is supposed to mean that zero is a natural number, that is something that I'm attaching to it. But really, I'm, like, what, what these kind of type rules are always defining are just relations. And um, a, a lot of the stuff, like whether we use a colon there or some other symbol, that is a syntactic choice that we are making. There's not, again, there is no clear right or wrong. Right? And, um, and we'll come to this later when we add contextual information. There is this turnstile symbol, and often people are confused about what that means because it doesn't really have a meaning. <laughs> it's just syntax. And what meaning we're attaching to it is sort of coming coming from ourselves, right? But, but we'll revisit that question. I've also labeled these rules. That's something that you see relatively often in papers as well, but that's just a mechanism to refer to them. So I've called the left rule Z and the right rule S, so that in principle we can talk about these rules again when we use them. And an example of using them is that if we want to derive from these rules that three is a natural number, Right? Then we can like, basically start at the bottom and write down successor of successor of zero and see whether we can conclude 
successfully using our type rules that that is a natural number. And now we can look at our rules and see, well, we want to conclude something for successor of successor of successor of zero, right? Which rule fits? The one on the left does not fit because it mentions a Z, but our term that we want to prove something about starts with an S. And so we have only one rule that can possibly fit. So we can try to apply the successor rule. Oh, sorry. And then we have to prove what is in the, in the line above, that successor of successor of zero is a natural number. And then again, we have only one rule that can possibly fit. And then we have to prove that successor of zero is a natural number. And again, we have only one rule that can possibly fit. And then we have that zero as a natural number. And that is true without having any premise. So if we arrive in a finite number of steps at something where we don't have anything left to prove, then the proof is complete using, using these kinds of rules. Okay, and even though this is all very simple and very trivial, this type system actually has a very desirable property which we are often trying to retain also for far more complex systems, namely that we're saying this type system is syntax directed. And what does that mean? That means that for every syntactic shape, so we have two syntactic shapes, zero and successor, we have exactly one rule. And that is making things much more easy to turn into algorithms, to turn into implementations, because there is never a choice, right? If we have to prove something like in the bottom line about a particular term, there is only one rule that could potentially be applied in order to establish that statement. And all we have to do is to check whether we can establish the premises of that rule. Right? If there are multiple rules for the same syntactic construct, it becomes far more complicated because then we might have to try one and see that it fails and then we have to backtrack and try another or we have to somehow make a smart guess with, with extra information. Right? So that's algorithmically more complicated if we want to implement these kinds of things. That's why it's generally considered to be a very desirable property of type systems to have syntax-directed rules because that makes it easy to implement them. And for example, systems with subtyping Right, are notoriously like often non syntax directed. Okay, but um, we might get to that later. Are there any questions at this point? Yes, what parts of these rules uh, can overlap, if any? Uh, so, if, for example, if we, if we, if we, so we had to start with uh, one on the right hand side here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so the question is, like, what kind of things and rules can overlap and, and whether it's valid. So, yeah, it is certainly valid. I mean, it's not invalid to have multiple rules for the successor of something. I mean, in this case, it would be difficult to find something else that kind of makes sense, right? But in principle, you can have multiple rules for exactly the same thing and say there is one way to derive this and there is a completely different way to derive the same thing. Right. That, that is allowed. It's just like if you want to turn this into an implementation, it means you have to actually like, do more clever work because you have to implement, as I said, you have to implement either some form of backtracking, like try the first thing, and if it fails, try the other thing. And that might to happen, have to happen recursively at many different steps in this process. Or you have to somehow do some extra analysis to say, oh, I can rule out this branch like from the beginning, right? So it's uh, from the perspective of, of wanting to implement things, it's desirable to have the syntax-directed property, but it is in no way required, and there are many valid type systems that are not syntax-directed, okay? Um, yes? Oh, that's an interesting question. So the question is, given a type rule, is the top part always syntactically simpler than the bottom part, or is it not? Um, I think you can construct systems. I mean, it's also a question of what actually, like, what do you count? Like, do you count sort of the number of syntactic constructs? I think you can 
uh, construct type systems where this is not the case, where you can, where, for example, you have an abbreviation for a more complicated construct and something that originally looks very simple expands to something which is far larger and then you have to check that. But obviously you're interested in it to become eventually simpler because in a finite number of steps you want to reach some point where you don't have to prove anything anymore. But it doesn't have to become simpler in every single individual step. So, um, right. Um, okay. And I mean, we could make some sort of nonsensical type rule that would say a successor of n is a natural number if, say, the successor of the successor of n is also a natural number, like add an extra s rather than remove that one. That rule would actually not be very harmful in this case. It would just be useless because we, like, we can only use it to introduce extra work <laughs> and we could never make progress towards actually proving something. But, um, but it wouldn't actually make the system sort of like, ill-behaved. So yeah, but but there are this kind of abbreviation thing is I guess the, the most common use case where you like have something which gets uh, more complicated. And what we'll often see also today here is that um, like okay, the individual preconditions get simpler, but you have several preconditions, and then you have to go and prove all of them. Yes. Yeah, that's, a, that's also a very good question. The question is, when, when reading or writing these type rules, are you going from the left-hand side to the right-hand side? Are you going from the inside to the outside? So the answer to that is kind of everything, everything at once or, or depending on the situation. So that's one of the like, perhaps confusing things of type rules, but also the, the actual beauty and power of them is that you often have multiple readings, and the type rule does not say one of the things is the input, the other thing is the output, and sometimes we can interpret them in different ways. But for that particular thing, these are too simple to see that yet, to really argue with that. We should revisit that point when we, when we have some um, more complicated rules. Is that okay for now, or...? Or did I misunderstand your point? I the point the mm -hmm. I was wondering, and maybe there are differences Yeah, no, let's, let's revisit that, definitely. I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting point, but um, we, we need a little bit more complexity to, to uh, uh, evaluate that. Okay. So, so as I said, this, this type system is boring because we cannot even write an ill-typed term, right? Because uh, we only have successor and zero, and if we don't have any additional constructs, and whatever uh, term we're writing using these two syntactic constructs is always going to be well-typed. So now let's look at a, at a slightly larger language, which is still quite boring because we can't really write any interesting computations, but we can see that it's getting closer to something like a programming language. So we have, like, depending on what you prefer, on the top we have the Haskell data type for expressions, on the bottom we have sort of what we would use as a syntax, now we use a meta variable E for expression, and um, we have a constructor for zero still, we have a constructor for successor, which takes another expression now, not, it's not forced to take um, something that is immediately another application of successor and zero. So we can like put an arbitrary expression after uh, the successor constructor, right? And then we have um, false and true. That should probably also be F and T, actually. I'm not sure whether I'm completely consistent on the slides there. That, um, that should probably be F and T. And uh, then equality, which I've been writing like in the, in sort of in the in the syntactic form more like we would um, know it from, from a Haskell program, and an if-then-else construct which has three, three sub-expressions. And um, again, sort of notationally, you'll see a lot of differences in the way these things are handled. Sometimes people are writing something like um, there are multiple, because we have multiple sub-expressions, right, in, in one expression, like um, if E1, then E2, else E3 has three sub-expressions in there. So sometimes people um, write something like e comma f comma g or something like that, colon colon equals to denote that they're using e and f and g in different contexts all to refer to expressions. That happens. 
um, some people are actually just writing e equals equals e in such a syntax diagram because it means like both are expressions, but it doesn't mean that they have to be the same expression. That have, or, or like me, some people are numbering them or adding primes, and there is a lot of convention there, right? And um, so it's and it's not always extremely precise. So in, in the Haskell data type has a very precise meaning. The syntax you have to like look a little bit more at the conventions. And then if you look at the type rules, they are, um, they're still relatively simple, right? But we have the, the two that we basically know already, but now the successor rule is actually a little bit more interesting because like the E that we have as an argument to the successor can actually be something that is not a natural number, so we can actually have something that is not actually type correct. And then f is a boolean, t is a boolean, because we have false and true, and there is no preconditions there. And then we have equality, where we say e1 equals equals e2 is a boolean if e1 is a natural number and e2 is a natural number. And then we have if then else, where we say, and this is something where we see something new, right? We say um, in order for if, if then else to have the type t, where t is now a meta variable standing for a type, right? e1 has to be a boolean, and e2 has to be a type, and e3 has to be the same type. And here, in a type rule, it very much matters. I'm getting to that question in, in a second. It very much matters that you're mentioning the same t twice, right? So here, this really implicitly says that e2 and e3 have to have the same type. We don't care which type, right? Both could be natural numbers, both could be booleans, but they have to have the same type, and then the whole if then else has to have the same type again. And now it's already getting a little bit more interesting regarding your question, because, right, it isn't really sad in this rule whether the T, the type that we're checking if then else against, whether that is an input, like whether we're starting by saying we have this if then else expression and a type, and we're trying to, like with a concrete type, check whether that is true, or whether we are sort of having only the expression as an input, and we're trying to somehow infer the right type from like going through these rules. And again, like we can actually do both to some extent. We can see what the rules allow, and if we turn this into an actual implementation, we can see whether we can like write a function that essentially has the, the type uh, given an expression, please give me its type, right? which would be more like inference. Um, but perhaps we can only or also write a function that takes an expression and a type as an input and essentially says yes or no. Right? And uh, these different readings, they are uh, often both possible up to some extent. And the type rules don't make it very explicit, like in which order you have to do things and what you see as input and what as output. Sorry, yeah, now you can. Yeah, this is, a, this is actually a question <laughs> that I would have been asking next. So, <laughs> so very good point. So the question is, couldn't equal also use a type variable? And indeed, uh, you, you can, right? I mean, uh, there is not just one proper rule for equality. And in this system, it would very much make sense to say, like, we only have Booleans and natural numbers as types so far anyway. They both support a meaningful notion of equality. So why should I say that equal goes from two natural numbers to um, Boolean only? I could change the equal rule to say E1 colon T, E2 colon T, E1 equals equals E2 colon bool, right? That would be, uh, would be a generalization that is perfectly okay. And that's a design choice that you can make, right? And, um, uh, but yeah, um, there's nothing better or worse about either of these. Um, and indeed, I think it's, it's one of the, the simpler exercises in, in the code file to say, like, yeah, come up with generalized rule of equality and do the necessary changes in the code. Um, yes, uh, yeah, you and then you. <laughs> Is there a notation, notation? or to define a set of valid types? Um, yes and no. I mean, so you can 
Um, you can say, so, so for example, if you, if you want to say, I think the question is essentially, like if, because I said natural numbers and Booleans are both supporting equality, if you think ahead and you, you think you may have a, like a type system where you have five different types, but only two of them are supporting equality, uh, then what do you do? And indeed, like one thing you can do is you can give two different rules, like one for equality on natural numbers and one for equality on Booleans. And then we would be exactly in a situation where we have two different rules for the same conclusion and we no longer have a syntax-directed system, right? Um, but it's perfectly valid. It makes sense to have like one equality conclusion rule for Booleans, one for natural numbers. And... Um, And then, indeed, we have to sort of look at both rules and do some clever reasoning. And another option is to, yeah, you can always introduce arbitrary new forms of judgments or constraints that you use in the prerequisites as well. And often just some ad hoc mathematical notation is also being used where people would basically just say uh, T has to be an element of the set that contains a natural number and a Boolean. Um, But that is, again, this is sort of like every author does this slightly differently. But there is no real problem because the interpretation would be to, like, you can always see it as being expanded in these two different rules and uh, you don't really, like, add an immense new power. Yeah? But even without notation, it's no longer syntax correct. Um, oh, that's a good point. Yeah, so, well, I mean, that depends. That depends. And so the question is, even without that notation, or even with that, even with that notation, it's no longer syntax directed. That depends a little bit. You can then you can go on and and see whether you can um, attach an algorithmic notion to this element of operation, right? And um, and that may be exactly something that. That, that I said, like, if you have a not syntax directed system, sometimes you can do some sort of slightly more clever advanced reasoning. And indeed, um, and in this case, sort of, you can see it as something that is becoming more syntax directed, right? Sorry for using these vague terms, but we're talking about vague notation up to a point, is more syntax directed. Um, because you can see, like, okay, it basically gives a suggestion that what you could algorithmically do is just do a sort of element check of, of the type. And, uh, and then, um, you don't necessarily have to like sort of do the full the full attempt. So I would, yeah, I would say at this point the notion whether a system is syntax directed or not is a little bit blurry, right? But I would probably call the rule with the with the element of syntax directed. But uh, but this is because I know that this is something that has a relatively straightforward algorithmic interpretation. There are other kind of side conditions that are very difficult to check. Sorry, yeah. Um. Yeah, uh, my, I have the same question, but I have another one. <laughs> the, uh, in the if rule curve, you said that the T, uh, the equality uh, for T, yes. is implicitly, is there also some syntax to like, make this explicit? So, like, we, we say T, and uh, so the both the T's in the top of the Mm, yeah, okay, so again, yeah, now the question is, okay, at the moment the equality between the two types is implicit, could we also make it explicit? Could we, for example, write something like E2 has type T1 and E3 has type T2 and then an additional precondition that says T1 has to be equal to T2? And yes, indeed we can, it is just that At that point, like this is one of the strengths of this notation, which probably almost everyone agrees on, that you can like establish complex equalities between different things um, without having to spell them out, <laughs> right? Um, But the other thing is closer to what you will do in an implementation, right? Again, like sort of there are different viewpoints where you can say like, if you are going to implement something like this, you will have to make an explicit equality check one way or the other between these two types at some point. And if you want to highlight that in your rules, then uh, you might want to do this. But um, not just because there are page limits in practice for academic papers, but also simply because there's usually enough clutter already. People are usually very eager to save some space and to highlight the things that are actually important. So that is actually really something you have to get used to, to, to sort of quickly at a glance identify sort of the use of the same variable in multiple different places and see that there is actually some quite 
deep meaning behind, behind that use of the same variable. But yeah, very good question. Um, OK. All right, so here's another example, right, derivation. But I, I think um, the only new thing it shows is that like how, how we deal with having multiple preconditions, right? So if you have an expression such as this one, and we want to establish that it has a particular type, well, and, and okay, perhaps there is still this directional aspect, right? So here we can now actually see, like, let's assume we are only starting with the expression, and we don't actually know what its type is, right? Um, and, uh, and this is sort of like just my, my way of reading this, or also of writing this. You can imagine you write the expression down, if z equals successor of z, then successor of successor of z, lz, colon, and you leave that blank, and then you draw the line, and then you look at the rules, and you see only the if rule applies, right? So that's syntax directedness of the system. Only that one can possibly lead to success. So then we have to establish that uh, the E1, which is zero equals successor of zero, that that is a Boolean, right? That is then the thing that we have to establish. And then we have to establish that successor of successor of zero is something. So we would write that down with a colon and a blank again. And we have to establish that this zero is something like the same thing eventually, but um, as well, right? And then we can, uh, we can go on. We can first go all the way up for the equality, which is straightforward, right? And then we can go up for the successor of successor of zero, and we see only the successor rule and the zero rule applies. And then we learn with the zero, or basically also with the successor rule, that the, the, the result must always be a natural number if it's successful, right? And, um, and in the case for zero as well. So then we basically from there learn that the result type has to be a, a natural number as well. So we can write it that way, but of course we could also see it as having the natural number as another input, like the type of natural numbers, and pushing everything down and just verifying that it's okay. Right? And the one is more sort of the inference reading and the other is more the, the checking. Okay? Okay, so one thing that I've been keeping a little bit implicit so far, but which is actually also there, right, is that we've been using T as a meta variable for types, and we really also have a syntactic category of types, and the only two things that are allowed there at the moment are nat and bool, natural numbers and booleans. And the Haskell um, data type for this is, is looking like this. And note that I've been writing deriving EQ to highlight that um, the, the thing that already came up, that we will need an equality check, almost certainly, if we ever want to implement this for stuff like this if-then-else. All right, so we need a notion of equality on types, and that's actually a rather deep rabbit hole, like equality of types. If you, like a, a nice, simple system like, like ours, has very simple equality of types. There is almost no argument, I guess, if you just have natural numbers and booleans to ask, like, are these two types equal or not, right? But that is something that becomes a very interesting question, for example, if you go to something like dependent type systems, where you have terms that, like, occur on, in the types and you have computations on types and you can ask yourself, like, is, the, is a vector of length 2 plus 2 the same as a vector of length 4? Right? And, and, and things like that, right? Or is a vector of length x plus y the same as a le vector of length y plus x? You, know, you, get, you get really interesting questions of equality in, in that context, right? But so far, uh, thankfully, we have no such problems. We can basically just use uh, syntactic equality as the equality of types, and there's no um, deep thing. But one other question we also need to ask is like, okay, if our types now also are a language, right? Like, so, like, we have an expression language, which has, like, these constructs that we've seen here, like these six different constructs, and we have a type language, which has these two constructs. Do we need types of types? Right, in Haskell, these are called kinds. Um, and the answer at this point is not really, right, because... With the type language, we are sort of at the same level of complexity as we were when we had just the natural numbers. Like, regardless of what type we're writing down, it's always sort of a well-formed type. There's no way to construct an ill-formed type, right? We cannot um, do such a thing like, um, I don't know, writing... Um, <clears throat> 
may be of int applied to bool, which we could write in Haskell, and that would not make sense, but we don't have sort of that level of expressivity at the moment, um, so, um, so we don't really need types of types yet, okay? Now if we look at implementation, right, so what, uh, what can we do? Um, so actually, again, we have, we have lots of options, right, when it comes to implementation. I'm just going to show one rather straightforward way in which we can turn these rules more or less systematically into some kind of implementation. And, um, and we are actually um, at the moment in a situation where we can read off the type of every expression almost immediately. So we have a form of inference, but the inference is not particularly clever. So we can, in general, just like use a function infer that takes an expression and gives us maybe a type, right? So maybe because, of course, we can write type incorrect expressions. Right. Um, and obviously maybe is also not a good result type because for any usable system we wanted to have proper type errors so we probably want to produce an, like an informative error message but conceptually right, um, maybe of type is, is, uh, is a good answer and then just sort of to be able to work um, like using the monadic and applicative structure of the maybe type, I'm going to give check a maybe unit type rather than a boolean type, right? So it's because sometimes we're going to use check within infer and the other way around, and that makes it nicer. Um, check takes an expression and a type as an input and gives a maybe unit, so where the just unit represents uh, yes, the check was successful, and nothing represents the check failed, and, uh, and what we're doing in order to check is simply we read off the type of the expression using infer, right, and assuming that that is successful, we're comparing um, the, the result type that we've inferred with the one that we, we wanted to have, okay? And how does the inference work? Well, um, <clears throat> this is really something that where you can basically turn the type rule systematically into, into code. Right, so if you look at the rule for Z, it had no preconditions, it was just saying this is a natural number. So here we just succeed and give the type T nat. Right, for successor we had a precondition, namely that um, the, the expression E must be a natural number, and there we had a concrete type that we have to check against, so we can use check for that, right? That's what we do first. And then if that is successful, we know that successor of E is also a natural number, so then we can just say, oh, okay, this is a natural number as well. And then this goes similarly for the others, so F and T are not a surprise. I think equal, at least in this um, monomorphic form, not in this generalized form that was suggested, right, it's also very easy because E1 has to be a natural number and E2 has to be a natural number and then the end result is a Boolean. Um, and the only interesting thing is if. Right, because there we have these two occurrences of T. And the way that we're doing this here, but of course we could also write it in a slightly more symmetric way, the way I'm doing this here is we first check that E1 is indeed a Boolean, as is expected, and then we infer the type of E2, and then we check that E3 has that type. Right? And if you remember how check is implemented, check does perform an actual equality test. Of course, we could also write, like, let's infer the type of E2, let's infer the type of E3, and then let's perform an equality test right there. That is just a matter of taste, right? Um, and then the final result is also T, okay? But it is a very straightforward uh, translation from, from the rules to, um, to the code, okay? Any questions? Oh, yes, yeah. Ah, yes, okay, let's um, briefly move to the code and let's start GHCI and let's look at the type, oh, um, load version 1.hs and let's look at the type of guard. So these days, I think in old versions of GHC it had a mona type, but these days it has an alternative type. Um, but uh, the idea uh, is, okay, so um, 
<coughs> Actually, I mean, it has a mona plus, I think it had a mona plus type earlier, and now it has an alternative type. So the notion, the, the idea of guard is if you have a, if you have a monad or a, a, a type constructor with some notion of failure, right? Then if you, if you give it a Boolean and the Boolean evaluates to true, then it will return or pure unit. And otherwise, it will use this notion of failure. And in the case of maybe the notion of failure that would be used as nothing. So essentially, the, the definition of guard Boolean um, in the maybe monad is simply if B, then just unit else nothing. Right? That, OK. Yeah? Um, I said that, but perhaps I was too quick. It's because we may want to... Uh, so the question is, why are we using maybe unit instead of just true and false? Um, because it, it, it turns out that we have to use check within infer. Um, so like, um, I can show this in the, in the actual code as well. Like, for example, here, right? And, um, and that happens quite often. And, and then it's just very convenient to, to have it sort of be in the, in the same type structure. Otherwise, we would have to use guard at every, every single one of these places. Um, but um. No, no. I mean, the question here is: Is the real reason, or the like, almost even like slightly, slightly more boldly phrased, the observation is that the real reason is that we want to use do notation? I'm not sure I see that, but um, I'll take your point. Perhaps it has something to do with it, <laughs> but let's perhaps not not you know, like that. I think that very quickly becomes philosophical. <laughs> so it's ultimately it's just a matter of taste. Of course, you could use boolean as a result type, and if that if if, if you like that better. Um, um, but um, yeah, I, I think um, it, it's also like if you. Like I said, ultimately, eventually, you don't want to use maybe, right? Eventually, you want to use some, probably some type checking specific monad, TC or something that has a notion of proper error messages and possibly has some, some additional state like positional information and, uh, and perhaps some, some name supply and some other stuff that is threaded. Right, and, and then most likely check has to be in, in the same like type construction in the same monad anyway as infer because you need to maintain the same kind of other things um, because then a, a plain boolean is no longer enough. Okay. Um, okay. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, is this bidirectional type checking? And I think in some form, yes. I mean, because we have a check and we have an infer. But um, the term bidirectional type checking is usually applied to things where it's slightly more interesting. Here, what we're doing is we're either reading off the type of an expression or we're checking immediately. So the notion of bidirectional type checking comes from situations where we sometimes want to push information further down. So where we have, say, a type annotation on a function, and then if we have a type annotation on a function, which has a function type, like we say, like we have f is of type nut to nut, then at that point we would know that we could check the argument against the type nut. We don't have to like guess the argument, we know, right? So we push that information further down. And you can apply similar things where you can push more complicated information, type information that comes from some annotations that are further up, further down the tree through many observations, while at other points, like letting things float up. And then it makes sense, even in the type rules, in such situations, to annotate type rules to have like, potentially different type rules that are specifically intended for synthesizing types and specifically intended for um, pushing things down. And then, then you don't really leave it open, um, like I said, like what the reading is, where like we our our type rules here. 
We make no real statement in the rules, like whether the T is an input or an output. In bidirectional type systems, you typically have a little annotation on the colon, like with an arrow up or an arrow down, where you specifically say, okay, this is a, a type rule where you're intended to push the type in as an input, and this is a type rule where the type is supposed to come out as an output. And, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, like so our, our implementation uh, is certainly sort of the beginning of a bidirectional uh, system. It's just a very trivial bidirectional system. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but good question. Thank you. Any others? Okay. Um, all right. So, so what the one thing that is missing from um, from our uh, thing so far, we've only been talking about the types, is evaluation, right? And um, type systems. The whole purpose of type systems is ultimately that we're interested in evaluation, right? Why are we type checking at all? That's because we, we are hoping that the types give us certain safety guarantees, that the types are easier to reason about than the actual value, right? And that we perhaps can do that using compile time, uh, at compile time, like at an earlier point in time, um, even independent of sort of concrete inputs and so on and so forth. So in many ways, not just more efficient, but also sort of conceptually easier. And, and then we want to like prevent certain things from going wrong um, during evaluation. And the whole point is that we want to formalize that part as well. We need to reason about evaluation in order to say whether the type system is any good, whether it actually prevents anything from, from happening that we want prevented. Right? And um, that's why, um, why we need this as well. And here, again, there are, there are branching things. Like We have many different evaluation strategies for, uh, for languages, and we can ask ourselves, what's the goal of evaluating a piece of code? Right? How far do we want to evaluate? In which order do we want to evaluate? And, um, and if you look at literature, right, by far the most programming languages are using something that's called eager evaluation, it's also called call by value evaluation, which is more or less equivalent. And, um, and, uh, and then you have sort of values that are corresponding to normal forms. They cannot be evaluated any further, even if you wanted to. And, um, and sort of the values in, in that context here would probably have this, this shape in our, in our little language. We have like zero or successor of another value like of a fully evaluated thing, which is only from these four things, and then false and then true, right? And, um, and, it <clears throat> and the idea of values is that there, there should always be a subset of expressions. I mean, that's not always 100% true. Sometimes you tend to forget or drop certain information from expressions, and sometimes you add certain things to values that are not directly admissible in the expression language, but like as an approximation, this is more or less true. Um, that values intuitively are some sort of subset of expressions. And I, I think in some theoretical treatments, it's even a requirement. They say like, okay, you're not even defining values as a separate um, syntactic category, you're essentially just seeing value being a, a sort of a, um, a test on an expression, right? So you can say, like, is this expression a value, yes or no? Um, but um, uh, that, that's one viewpoint you can take. But in Haskell, we have um, something that is actually, is actually lazy evaluation, which is actually called by need. But a few... I don't really want to go into call by need. So call by need, the, the idea of call by need, and that's one of the, the cool features of Haskell, if you want, is that, that you have sharing. Right? If you're using things multiple times, not only are they evaluated only when you need them, but also um, they're shared between multiple users. So if one thing needs them, and you evaluate them, then you don't evaluate something unnecessarily uh, a second time, right? But this is um, this is more like an an implementation optimization of um, what's called call by name, uh, where you're simply saying we are we are not 
we're not evaluating things if we don't need them, but we, are, we also don't care if we evaluate them multiple times as a result. Right? So they, these two things always lead to the same result. Call by name and call by need always lead to the same result, but call by need can be substantially more efficient than call by name in practice. Um, and in, uh, in these forms, we typically like, have a notion of weak hat normal form, and, um, and that's sort of like an, an evaluation point where we only have revealed the top-level constructor, and the rest is still unevaluated. And the only difference this makes in our simple language is for a successor, where in the weak hat normal form, the successor is still an expression as an argument, and not, um, not a value. So once we know that the top-level constructor is a successor, we would stop. And again, like this W syntactic category is also a subset of expressions. So this is really a choice we can make, but I will, for the rest of this talk, mostly use this call-by-name strategy because it's closer to what we're used to from Haskell. Okay? So here's an example. So successor of successor of zero is an expression that happens to be both a normal form and in particular also in weak head normal form. So everything that is a normal form is also in weak head normal form. But something like S applied to an if then else is in weak head normal form because we have a successor at the top, right? But the rest is sort of unevaluated and could be evaluated further. So this expression is not a normal form. Okay. So yes. That are not? That I have expressions in normal form? No. Um, so the question is, is it intended that I have expressions in normal form that are not type valid? So, yeah, I mean, so again, there are multiple different like lit, in small ways, different ways in which you can write things down. So you can say, okay, I'm in this, certainly in a simple system like this, I could like have a like Boolean value, values category and a natural number values category, and I could keep them completely separate. And actually, this is something which I'm going to do in the code because it makes certain things a little bit easier. Um, but in more complicated systems, it, it's sort of like, in particular, you, you probably, I mean, for example, in weak head normal form, right? Um, <coughs> you probably don't want to introduce a notion of expressions there, um, like a syntactic notions of expressions that identify a particular type, because that is something that in general you cannot even tell. You are assuming that if you have been type checking before that that will be a well-typed expression, but it's not going to be specified on the, on the syntactic level. So and in general what we are going to say is because these are essentially subsets of the expression language that the type system extends to these as well, right? That we're, um, that we're going to consider well-typed values just as we are going to consider well typed expressions. But yes? In the non version, you can now have like successor of true or something. I could, but I mean the but but if you're saying that the expression type rules are applying to the values as well, it would still be an ill typed value, right? And um, so so the uh, the statement that we are eventually interested in is something saying like if we have an expression of a particular type, it should eventually evaluate to a value of the same type, right? And, uh, and then in that statement, it's implicit that it should not yield in an ill-typed value that, uh, like, say, says something like successor of true, okay? Um, but, yeah, um, thank you for the question. Any others? Okay, good. Um, so... In, also, in, on the Haskell side, we, can, we have a lot of freedom of how we do this, right? Because we, we, like, we could write an evaluator that just goes from expression to expression and just say we, we do it by convention that the resulting expression has to be a value. We have some, sort of an extra proof obligation. Uh, just to make it a little bit more explicit, I've been choosing here to, to make these things, these concepts explicit, even though the way I've do it, been doing this then means r replicating a lot of the structure of expressions, again, sort of for weak head normal forms and for normal forms. So if we want to talk about normal forms, 
like our way of representing them here would be like is either and here I'm doing this what you suggested like I'm splitting sort of either we have a value of a natural number and then it should really be a natural number or a boolean which should really be a boolean so here actually the normal form type that I've defined is not in direct correspondence to the v as I've been writing it here because it has this extra restriction and um, and the weak hat normal form type I'm also doing this but here, for Booleans, I'm actually using the built-in Haskell Booleans because there are only true and false. But for natural numbers, I'm defining my own weak hat normal form natural number type, which has WZ and WS, because we need this WS of an expression there, right? And um, uh, <coughs> that's this. And now evaluation is a, like a slide full of code, but it's all very simple code. All right, so it goes from an expression to maybe a weak head normal form. Right, and uh, so this is sort of uh, a call by name uh, evaluation. And in the case that we have, um, and here we really just do pattern matching. I mean, I'm starting with the implementation here, but we're going to look at evaluation rules as well in a bit. So um, uh, if we start with a zero, we um, produce, um, uh, we're done, right? We, have, we already have weak hat normal form, so we just produce the WZ constructor. If we have successor of E, we're also done, right? because we don't have to look inside the expression if we're only interested in evaluating the weak hat normal form. So we immediately succeed and return the uh, appropriate value, similarly for false and true. And now the other interesting thing about sort of where the laziness kicks in, so to speak, or the, uh, the call by name kicks in, is the implementation of equality. Because here I'm evaluating both the left and the right expression, but remember that's only up to weak head normal form. I'm expecting, and this is where the potential type errors can kick in, like I'm expecting that the results are natural number values, Right, natural number we had normal form values, and then I'm looking at those, and if they're both zeros, then I succeed, and if they're both successors, then I'm going to call eval on the sub terms again, and this is exactly sort of the lazy interpretation of equality testing, and otherwise I immediately say false, not looking at what comes underneath of the, uh, like if I have one zero and one successor, I don't need to look at the rest anymore, I can immediately say false, right? And the definition of if then else I think is, is pretty straightforward, so I'm not going to uh, say any more about this, okay? Yes? No, so this, this is a good point. So the, 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 the question is, in this evaluation function, we're not dealing with type. No, this is indeed correct. So we're deliberately writing this evaluation function in such a way that it works on an arbitrary expression. And what will happen if we have a type incorrect expression is most likely that we'll get nothing, right? Because we have maybe we had normal form. So we'll at runtime, we'll... For example, we have these, these left arrow lines with W nut or with W bool on the left, right, in the equal and in the if, and one of these will probably fail, right? Um, and, and we might get nothing. But also it's possible, and perhaps not in this language, but in other languages, it's possible that you have programs that are type incorrect that nevertheless yield results. That's actually one of the reasons why some people are saying dynamic typing is, is, the, is a great thing, right? Because um, why shouldn't I be able to put an integer followed by a boolean followed by a character in a list if I can manage this and I only select the right thing and I only like, combine things and the type system is terribly limiting because I know what I'm doing. And, um, so, uh, it, and, and for that it's perhaps like, actually instructive right, to have an evaluation function that you, can, that you can also run on type incorrect terms to see what's actually going to happen. Where is it going to break? Is it going to break? Uh, I'm, I'm seeing you, you but uh, let's, let's do the follow-up first. Equality between different types. Um, it, well, I mean, if, if E1 does not evaluate to a natural number, right, then the first line 
will already cause failure, right? But indeed, I mean, it's possible we could implement the evaluator in such a way that it returns false. I mean, what we're ultimately saying is we don't care what this evaluation function does on ill-type terms because we are going to say, like, we're only ever going to call eval on types that we have previously type-checked. Right? But, um, but it's nevertheless instructive to see what happens. Uh, I think there was another question here somewhere, but first you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's another one of these like slightly subtle things of the do notation, and I think that has also changed in one of the recent versions of GHC somehow with like which type class constraints this introduces. But if in the if in the maybe monad you're doing on the left hand side of the arrow you're doing a pattern match and that pattern match fails, it's actually going to result in nothing. Right, because it's sort of calling the fail function. And in uh, sort of in, in, in classic ancient Haskell, fail was a, a member of the monad class, which was always a little bit of a wart because like, theoretically it doesn't belong there. And now it's somewhere else, but I, is it called monad fail? I don't actually even know. <laughs> um, and that is slightly, um, is slightly more disciplined now. Um, yeah, okay. Other questions? Okay. So let's look at evaluation rules. So again, there are two different styles I want to briefly mention. One is called big step operational semantics and one, I mean, in general, first of all, probably I have to say there are different styles of semantics. And um, I think the two most common styles you're going to be confronted with are operational semantics, which is by far the most common in like programming language theory papers and denotational semantics. Uh, denotational semantics. I think Sandy was pitching like in, on uh, the first day that he's he's going to to look at that. Um, denotational semantics is typically very elegant. The idea of denotational semantics is you're you're defining semantics by translation into something different, uh, which you hopefully already know. Often some complicated mathematical structure, though, which is not all that easy to understand if you haven't heard about it before. But essentially, the idea is you're doing. I, uh, I'm going to get. You're, you're you're doing some sort of translation of your programs into some other domain, and then you already know something about that other domain, and you're deriving semantics from that. The idea of operational semantics, in turn, is that you. Um, have this notion of reduction where you're associating sort of an expression with something that is further reduced and you're sort of um, like going sort of this, this stepwise simplification or eventually simplification of your expressions. Um, perhaps now let's uh, interject the question. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I mean, <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting corner case. <laughs> it's just not necessarily something that uh, allows you a lot of additional insight. <laughs> but yes, and, and, and the other form of trivial semantics is uh, everything means the same. I mean, so uh, yeah, these are, all, these are all okay. But um, uh, okay. So... Um, in operational semantics, you have sort of two big different division lines. One is big step semantics, um, big step operational semantics, where you associate an expression with its final value. And often this is written using this double down arrow, but again, there are other notations as well, like single down arrow and, um, and uh, probably yet others. And, um, and the idea is just that you, I mean, this is very close to what you end up in an implementation, end up with an, in an implementation, because we are, we, our eval function is going from expression to maybe we had normal form. So basically you're associating expression with its final result, right? So big, big step um, semantics is typically very close to what your implementation is like, right? And the expectation here is if the expression already is a value, Right? then it should evaluate to itself. Right? The other school is small step operational semantics, where you associate an expression with another expression, which is sort of reduced one step further. Right? And here the um, and then you do that multiple times, right, until you hit a value, and then the expectation is that if an expression is a value, then there is no rule that takes it any further. Like the, the, and, and in fact, that um, the idea is like that 
um, <clears throat> at least among the well-typed expressions, the only expressions that do not evaluate further are, are the, exactly the values. That, that's, that's the idea there. Um, so here are big step evaluation rules for what we, we've seen so far. Right, so zero goes to zero, successor of E. This is pretty much a direct translation of what we had in the code. Right? Um, false goes to false, true goes to true. And then um, here we actually have uh, <coughs> like, um, multiple rules for equality. So the, all this implements equality. And, um, and here you can see this is not... This is not completely syntax directed, right? So here we have to like apply a little bit more logic, and you also see like the, the implementation of equality is by far the most uh, is by far the most difficult case in our code, right? Because it's sort of a transcription of all these rules, and and that's kind of what I mean. What happens? So it's not that things become impossible if you're not syntax directed, but you typically have to do more work and more reasoning and see how everything fits together and at which points exactly can you make the case distinctions, right? Because all these rules are for equality, essentially, and 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 because the the value here is really supposed to be an output and not an input. I mean. Um, um, but, um, but yeah, apart from that, it's, again, it's just a, a transcription of, of what we had in the code. And then you have rules for if, which are also, you, again, you have two things there, but here it's relatively simple uh, in the code because the if-then-else uh, uh, expression in Haskell does exactly what we want, right? And, um, um, and if you want to look at, at small step evaluation rules instead, then at first things become a little bit simpler because we don't even need rules for data constructors. They're values, like Z is a value, successor S, S of E is a value, F is a value, T is a value. We don't need any reduction rules for those. We only need reduction rules for equality, and they're all, they don't even have preconditions. So if, like, if uh, Z equals to Z, then that evaluates to true, and if we have successor of E1 equals successor of E2, we reduce that to checking that E1 has to be equal to E2. All right, this is the sort of the lazy case again. And then, um, like in, in the other two as well, we immediately stop and we immediately say false. And then for if then else, again, also if we, if we already know that the condition is false, we can reduce in one step to uh, E2. And if we already know that the condition is true, then we can reduce in one step to E1. So, so far it looks like small step is far simpler, but the point is that we haven't been telling the complete story because, for example, if we have an if then else um, expression and the condition is not false or true, then we currently don't have a rule. Right? So in addition to these simple rules with small step semantics, you then need context rules, and they're pretty boring. <laughs> but they're basically just saying, okay, right, if we have an equality and it's not yet one of the other cases, then we start by evaluating the left argument, if we can. And then if the left-hand side is already a value, then we evaluate the right argument. And of course, again, you can actually be more flexible here, or you can change the order around, right? But this is what, what these rules are saying in this order. And then also in an if, right? If we have an if, we evaluate the condition until we hopefully hit the point where it's true or false. Right? So, and then with these context rules, you get to the same power as big step. And then you can ask the question, what is better? And, um, I think it's not, there is no clear answer here. So, like the advantage of big step is that it's closer to the implementation. The main disadvantage of small step is that you need these context rules. But then the non context rules are often simpler, and often in papers you'll see that the context rules are just omitted. Like they're literally not given because people say, yeah, make them up yourselves. You know, you know what they should be, right? And then you save space. But, um, but the, the real reason why many papers are preferring small step semantics is that, um, uh, and that's something that currently does not play a role because we only have simple programs that never loop. But in big step semantics, you cannot really distinguish a situation where a term is stuck because 
you simply have no rule to evaluate it any further, and a situation where you go on evaluating forever because you loop somehow. Right? In big step semantics, you're always in one step, like sort of in one like rule associating an expression with its final value. So what will happen for a non-terminating expression is that you would have to have some sort of infinite proof tree, so you simply cannot give such a judgment. You simply cannot associate a looping expression with a value. There is simply no rule that applies successfully because you cannot establish the preconditions. And for a type incorrect expression that somehow gets stuck, that somehow yields to some nonsensical application somewhere, you have the same situation. You also can give nothing that applies. So for big step, um, you have a you have a little bit of a problem distinguishing sort of like stuck terms due to type incorrectness from non-terminating terms, and often you do want to distinguish them because often you have non-terminating terms that are type correct in, in in most programming languages, and that's I think that's the main reason why many um, papers are preferring. Um, small stuff. Semantic. I think it's also a little bit of a cultural divide, but I never quite understood it. But at least I've heard rumors that in the US, generally small stuff semantics are preferred, and in Europe, generally big stuff semantics are. But I don't know whether that is in any way really true. That is just a rumor that I've I've heard. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah. How do you specify evaluation? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the question is, how do you specify evaluation order? And, I mean, here we've been relatively clear, right? So um, I said, like, in, in these context rules, I, I've very explicitly said, if you have E1 equals, equals E2, and E1 is not a value already, right, um, then we do evaluate the left-hand side, and we can only reduce... E2 to E2 prime if the left-hand side of the equality is already a value. So here, I have been very precise. If I look at the corresponding rule for the, um, uh, for the big stuff semantics, so how does that happen here? Yeah. Yeah, here, you cannot really say, right? Um, because uh, th there's, no, there's no implicit ordering between two separate preconditions, okay? Now, the question is, does it... Does it actually matter? I mean, in, in our case, evaluation is to totally side effect free, right? I mean, so there is no, there's no real difference in the outcome depending on in which order we're doing something. If we suddenly had effects, like if we had like sort of like the evaluation can print something to the screen, then it would matter. And then we might have to encode that somehow, like sort of in a similar way in big step semantics as you would do this using a state monad in Haskell actually, by, by threading something through by saying, okay, we have an additional input to the one which then goes into the other, which sort of like symbolizes the accumulated effects or something like that. So if you want to, you can be explicit about evaluation order here as well. But in general, you perhaps don't, just don't care. And if we wanted to, we could make this one ambiguous as well. We could basically just add um, uh, uh, S equal to without having the V1 on the left and just like having them both symmetric and then it would just be up to the implementation to decide in which order um, you would reduce them and uh, <coughs> you should probably establish somehow that it doesn't matter in which order you're, you're doing things. So yeah, but, but it's, a good, it's good that you pointed this out. This is in this particular example another difference which, or actually a difference between these two systems that um, the, uh, the small step rules are precise about order and the big step rules are not. Um, okay. Um, right. So, let me see. We have three. Um, it's about half time, right? Um, shall we do a ten-minute break? Would that be appreciated? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So five, five past, I would start again. Hello? Okay.
Thank you. Um, let's continue. So um, let's um, let's look briefly. As I said, I don't want to prove anything today, but I want to uh, convey what are the desirable properties of type systems. Now that we have been talking about type systems and evaluation, and there are really two main properties that um, are together usually used to say a type system is correct or a type system is sound or something like that. And, and those are called preservation and progress. Sometimes preservation is also called subject reduction. Um, but, um, but the idea is of preservation is whenever we reduce an expression, we expect the type to be maintained. Right? So we expect not suddenly to get something that is either ill-typed or, or something that has a completely different type. Now, there are type systems where this type to be maintained is slightly relaxed. So where, for example, if you have type system with subtyping where um, you're actually allowed that the type becomes more specific over time because you discover more things. But you typically at least want the type to be similar or like in a very concrete way be related to the type of the original thing. Right? And um, so basically if you phrase this in, in uh, big step or small step semantics and big step semantics, uh, you would say like if we have an expression that has a type T and we can evaluate the expression to a value V, then the value v should also have the type t. Again, using sort of this, this implicit notion that values are a subset of expressions, right? Just using the same rules. And uh, for small step semantics, uh, we would say if we have an expression of type t and the expression reduces in one step to an expression e prime, then e prime should also have type t. Right? That is that is one ingredient. And the other is called progress, and that is essentially sort of this well-typed programs do not go wrong kind of, uh, like this is the, like this famous sentence from Milner. Um, uh, that's, that's really what covers that. Um, when an expression, whenever an expression is well-typed, we expect it not to get stuck. So the idea is there should always be a way to make progress, to continue reducing it so that we eventually get a value or, and this is where it becomes a little bit tricky with big step semantics, or we can go on forever, uh, right? I mean, there are some situations where programs are well typed, but they can still loop, and that is often, that is often allowed. And in small step semantics, it's very easy to, to phrase this property, right? Because we can say, if an expression is of type T, then there must be a reduction rule that takes E as an input and goes somewhere else to some E prime. And so that means we cannot end up in a situation where we have a non-value. Um, oh, so actually, I, I, this is a mistake on the slide. Or it must be a value. This is like, I mean, okay, so... Uh, if, um, so, sorry, this is, this is really incomplete. So, um, it should say, like, if we have an expression of type T and E is not a value, right, then there must be an E prime such that we can go from E to E prime. But if it is a value, then we, ex like, then conversely, we expect that there are no rules that take values any further. So, the sort of the, 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 the final, the goals of reduction, should always be should always be the values, right? But we can have an infinite reduction sequence, right? We can go for, go on forever, like so. We um, like and, and sort of um, preservation then says that E prime has to have the original type again, but and so there must be again a rule and so on and so forth. But uh, it's possible to loop and to go on forever, and that's the reason why it's not so easy to express this for big step semantics unless all terms are actually terminating, because it Basically, um, we cannot express this sort of like uh, expression that goes on reducing forever. Right? Um, so we could only say something which is much much stronger um, that every expression um, must reduce to a value. Right? But that really rules out non-terminating expressions. Um, uh, so so that's one that's one of the reasons why. Um, why small step semantics are typically preferred in uh, literature, in particular for languages that are um, admitting non-terminating expressions. Okay, 
So we sp I'm aware that we spend sort of like more than half <laughs> of the of the allocated time now on version one. Uh, the versions are like we, well, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not going to make any promises. We'll see how far we get. But in principle, we've been covering a lot of foundational ground now that uh, we don't have to cover again. Um, so we'll see um, how um, how quickly it goes from here. So. Um, that's just very briefly, even though, uh, but I think it's a good uh, moment. Um, also look at the code, uh, the actual summary of the code, right? If we, if we look at the version 1.hs file as it is in the repository, um, we see there's, there's really just the stuff that we have been covering. So we have our expression data type, we have our type data type, we have check and infer, right, as given. We have um, uh, normal forms, uh, we, we have weak at normal forms, we don't even necessarily need normal forms, but in practice you probably still want them, right? Because, I mean, again, we cannot really phrase anything interesting uh, yet anyway, but uh, eventually, if you say, if you write, a, a, if, you, if we would have something like addition, right, in our language, which we currently don't, um, it's probably not what we're interested in. We say, let, let's add three and three, and the answer is it's successor of something. Right? That's, not, that's not the answer we expect. We expect something like which, which says six. So there are situations in which we want to uh, continue evaluating after we've reached weak at normal form. And in, in Haskell, we often have this happening while printing, right? So if we, if we do something like... Um, I don't know, ones is one cons ones, right? Then in principle, the, the weaker normal form of this is just the cons. And we, don't even, we wouldn't even look at the one and we wouldn't even look at the recursive call to ones. But if we start printing this, that will still evaluate like forever, right? Because the printing is driving the evaluation here. If we don't have some notion like printing, we probably want to write something that evaluates further. So if we have this eval function here that goes to weak at normal form, which is the one that I've shown. But um, is it... Yes, yeah, one of the exercises here, but it's also given in one of the later versions, is to write a function evolve completely that actually goes all the way to normal form. Right? So that's um, something you can be doing. There are a couple of exercises in here, um, in all the version files, actually. Some of them are solved in later versions, but others are not. So, um, so I don't have... I haven't included all the solutions to all the exercises. Some of them are actually rather tricky exercises. So uh, some are very easy, and some are like far more work intensive. I, I think it's relatively obvious from the exercise in which of the two categories it falls. <laughs> but if in doubt, you can always ask questions on the channel as well or afterwards. So if you want to do any of these and you're worried what you're getting into, you can, <laughs> you can try to ask me for sort of like a, a difficulty estimate. Um, okay. Let's go back to the presentation. So the next step is to add variables. And in particular, what we want to add is we want to just add two new constructs to our expression language, let, let bindings, and variables. Like, um, right, let introduces a variable that we can then reuse. And, um, and this is, like, as I said initially, this is making things a lot more complicated, actually, right? Because it introduces all sorts of new problems. And um, so, for example, we have to answer the question, is X, where is X actually in scope, right? And the related to that is, is let supposed to be recursive or not? So, for example, in this syntactic construct, let X equals E1 in E2, where can we actually refer to this X that we're introducing there? Only in E2 or also in E1, right? Or only in E1, I mean, that would be a strange language, but, <laughs> right? I mean, in principle, or, or nowhere, right? I mean, so, so that's definitely a question that we have to answer, which is not at all obvious just from looking at the syntax, right? And, um, and then we also have to answer things like, what actually happens if we refer to a variable, because the variables are now all, like, we can, like, we can just refer to variables, x, 
or, or whatever we, we call a, a variable in concrete syntax, it, that's just a valid expression now, but what does it mean? Right? What does it mean if there's no enclosing let? Or what does it mean if there are two enclosing lets? Does it refer to the inner or the outer? And so on and so forth. So there are all these kinds of issues. Um, what happens if we refer to things out of scope? What happens if we shadow names? What happens if we somehow substitute things and capture things and so on? And um, we'll have to deal with them to some extent. Right? So the first thing... Um, we observe is that we need some sort of contextual information and actually both well perhaps uh, yeah, perhaps for type checking and for evaluation to some extent right so if we just have a term like x equals equals y and we ask ourselves what does it reduce to then the answer is we can't really tell you have to tell us what x and y mean right either we can throw an error and say x is not even in scope um, or we have to at least get some information like that says, okay, X is actually defined somewhere else to mean this, right? But we need some additional information. Without uh, extra help, we can simply not deal with something that has this form. And also, if we have to answer, like, if true, then X else X. Well, okay. So in this particular special case... Right? We might actually be able to say, well, no, we don't, right? I mean, <laughs> we might be able to say that the, that the expression is probably well typed because true is a Boolean and X and else, like the, the then and the else branch, have the same type because they're both X um, and two occurrences of X will have the same type. But, um, but we, if we don't know the type of X from somewhere, there is no answer that we, like, that we can give to the question what the type of this expression is, right? So, so this is what we need environments for, right? And, um, and uh, that's a very common thing for, for nearly all type systems to, to store contextual information in environments. And there are actually many, many different forms of environments for different sorts of type systems and sort of the like uh, associating variables to their types, in, uh, variables that are currently in scope. That is kind of the simplest form of environment. But another form of environment that is being used in type checking is, for example, when you, when you, uh, when you enter the realm of type classes in Haskell. Right? And in Haskell, there is not just a notion of, oh, these are the variables that are in scope and these are their types, but there is additionally a notion like, these are the type class constraints that you can assume about these variables that are in scope, right? It's not just that you have something um, that is uh, like an X that is of type A, but additionally you might know that equality holds for A and that show holds for A, and this is sort of extra contextual information which we would also pass in some kind of environment. So if you go to, uh, to systems with type classes, you typically have uh, like either more complicated environments or even two different sorts of environments, one that, that stores uh, types and the other that stores con constraints or type class constraints about them. Um, but in the simple form, you can, you can uh, see um, environments as either finite maps or even lists uh, that associate uh, variables with, uh, with types. So, so um, uh, the typical thing is that you use Greek letters to denote environments, but again, that is just convention. There is no inherent meaning in Greek letters, but this is where, where sort of the, uh, I guess, the, the jokes about type systems being full of Greek uh, come from, uh, because like, no, Greek letters are often being used there, or at least capital Greek letters are often being used there. Um, and... Um, and so an empty environment is often denoted as epsilon, but that's again also just a choice. Um, so that's just a placeholder for, say, the empty list. And then in this case, we're establishing that environments are extended to the right. So, um, so uh, we have an extension of an environment with a new mapping between a variable and its type. Right? And then we have a sort of a new form of rule for membership in an environment, right, which is sort of this element of thing, which is essentially just, yeah, sort of, it again has sort of an algorithmic notion which corresponds to lookup, right? We do a lookup in a list and we find the right 
variable that we're looking for and we're returning uh, the corresponding type, right? That's, that's sort of the algorithmic notion that is captured in these rules. And it says that if we, if we have an environment that as its last entry has x colon t, right, then x colon t is, is contained in that environment. That's what the first rule says, and there are no further preconditions, right? So x colon t is contained in the environment that as its last element has the uh, x colon t. And then um, if we have sort of an, uh, if we want to establish, like if you, if you take the algorithmic notion, if we want to establish that x1 colon t1 is in, in, in some other environment that is extended with x2 where x2 is not equal to e, x1, we, um, we, we continue looking in sort of in the rest of the, of the gamma, right? I'm, I'm taking a very specific algorithmic viewpoint here. You can also like, look at it the other way around again. Again, there are many different readings of these rules. And I'm using sort of the... Um, the, uh, the, uh, the non-equals a little bit ad hoc. What, what would happen if I, don't, if I don't have this condition? Would it be bad? Would it make the type system... Do you think it would make the type system wrong? Yeah? It would? So yeah, so what the question is then, what, what, is, what happens if we have um, like both axes of type int and then another axis of type bool in the same environment, then we can derive both things being contained in the environment, which to some extent is true, right? I mean, <laughs> they are both contained in the environment, but it's not what we probably want because, uh, yeah, um, it, it, like if we typically shadowing is interpreted in such a way that, yeah, sort of the previous use of a variable, if you, like if you in Haskell define let x equal something in an expression and there's already an x in scope, then the outer x is simply not visible anymore temporarily in that, in that scope. And, uh, and here we would get a really strange, uh, we would get a really strange system with a potential, potentially uh, unwanted behavior. Yeah, so, yeah? Exactly. Yeah. 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 The rule would be ambiguous. Yeah. So I mean. So, but that means we. But there's no. There's nothing. That's again to understand, right? There's nothing inherently wrong with having ambiguous rules. Um, but it means we could then derive both axes of type bool is in the environment, and we could derive axes of type int, which is also in the environment. And that means that in a particular situation, we could derive that like sort of a particular use of x has either type int or has type bool, and that's almost certainly not going to be what we want. But of course we could associate it, like I mean there are interesting systems, right? We could imagine a system where we have some sort of type directed name lookup, and that is actually something that exists in languages like Idris up to a point, right? Where you can say, if you know the type that you're looking for, Right? Then you're specifically looking through all the things in scope and see whether there is one thing that has the right type, and then you're using that. So it's not necessarily a bad idea to do this, but you have to be really, really careful and know what you're getting into. I think you were first, and then you again. Uh. Right now we are checking if the name is the same. Oh, uh, yeah, no, yeah, no, that, but that's... Not the same. Yeah, yeah, but that's okay, right? I mean, that's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, if you, let's say, okay, so the question is if for type directed lookup, wouldn't we have to check whether the types are SM? I think the type directed lookup wouldn't, like, would, is only partially would be implemented at, at a point like this. So here we would basically say, okay, so if we have, uh, if we have multiple versions of X in scope at different types, then we, do allow, without sort of this inequality concern, we do allow to derive uh, that X can potentially have all these different types. And then 
at a different point where we have to say it's required that the type really is an input because like if we have to synthesize something then uh, like infer something is going to be really difficult we can we can basically um, use this kind of statement simply what like of, of all the occurrences of x in the environment there must be one that has the right type so that's then basically the interpretation we're taking here Yeah, but but look, if you're seeing if you're seeing the type like in, in in the question, like if you're seeing the type as an input here, right, and not as an output, if you're seeing like x colon t is actually both the x and the t are an input, you're simply asking. Then basically, you're simply asking, is there a, a binding from x of type t in the environment? Yes or no? And then it's a very simple question, and then you don't need the non non equals constraint, right? But if you're interested in seeing only the x as an input, but the type as an output, right? Then you probably uh, want to take the viewpoint where you say, well, the sort of the, the most in the innermost binding or the closest binding is, is this one and I don't really want to look any further. But I I, I mean that this is like type directed name lookup is very interesting, but I think it leads too far. <laughs> um sorry, I mean perhaps um, yeah perhaps afterwards. Um yeah? Um that's possibly true. Yeah it's almost certainly true. Uh yeah 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 yeah. Um uh, let me see what X is of type. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. The 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 one on the top should be X one. Thank you. Yeah, that's just strong. And you had another. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes. You. Um, I must admit at the moment that sequent calculus is something that I'm always mixing up this sort of a personal weakness of mine. Um, I think, I mean, there's definitely relations between all these different things, but um, is Adam here? <laughs> or does anyone else know? Can, by chance, no good answer to that? You? Uh, Yeah, yeah, go cool. Mm hmm Okay, so yeah, so that's a good question. So the, the question is, what's the significance of the weak head normal form? So uh, the point is, like, I mean, if you want to evaluate all the way, then that is pretty clear what that means. You just you, you just reduce everything that you can. But if you don't, then the question is, what is sort of the least amount of evaluation that you can do that reveals something new, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and sort of like if you are just reducing a function application, even though we don't have function applications yet, to another function application, that doesn't really give you any new insight, right? Um, but the moment you reveal sort of like a top-level constructor, there might really be other constructs in the language that can do something with this amount of information, like in our case, the equality operator, which says, like, if I already know sort of the top-level constructor of the two natural numbers, I can already do something with it, right? And similarly, with a function application, um, if you know that the function application, like if the, f the function part of the function application reduces to a lambda, even though you don't exactly know what the body is, you know I can, I, you know you have something now that you can do. And so, uh, in that sense, the, the significance of weak head normal form is sort of that's the 
that's sort of the unit of reduction that you want to do in order to have some new insight so that other constructs can make progress. Okay? Thank you. Yeah. I think there was something over there, which I'm always, I, mean, I must admit that, like with the lights, it's very difficult to see whether there are hands up on the right side or not, but nobody right now. Okay, um, good. Okay, so and now let's, let's look at type checking in, uh, with a context. So, so type checking rules with a context now look like this. And when I say look like this, it's really, the only important thing is that we now need three things, right? We need, we, it's no longer enough to, and actually the A should be a T probably, but um, it's no longer enough to relate an expression with a type, but we, we can only do so in general if we have additional information that is in this environment. So we need three things. And whether we would write something like type checks parenthesis open, gamma, comma, e, comma, a, parenthesis closed, or whether we use this sort of fancy mix fix, dist fix notation with the turnstile and the colon, that is just a syntactic choice, right? And that's um, often the turnstile is being used to sort of attach contextual information to something that already has some intuitive meaning. But this is where it becomes really blurry, because the moment we are starting to say the type rules look like this, then the statement E colon A or E colon T alone does not really have a notion. I mean, it just doesn't exist anymore. It's no longer a relationship that is well defined. But we tend to see like E colon T to read that as E has the type T. So it kind of makes sense to say under the context gamma, E has the type T. But it's, it's essentially it's just syntax, right? It's a it's sort of like a, an, an operator that consists of both the turnstile and the colon and has three places for three arguments. And the rest is just just a choice. And um, but the use of the turnstile in in typing judgments is actually uh, sort of the the inspiration for the well-typed logo, which in the past used to be more explicit. Where like in the in the really really old days, it was really just a turnstile. But now people are reading this as a G or something. But it is uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's the reason why why the logo looks like this because then. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, so most of the type rules, in particular all the type rules that we've had so far, they need to be extended to the setting where we have the context, but they don't really do anything with it. So if we look at the, the old rule and the new rule for, for if, they look totally alike, just that the gamma is everywhere and it's never changed. Uh, it's just like there is a context, we don't use it for this particular rule, but it's sort of passed on between the preconditions and the result, right, in the same way. And the places where it is being used is in the variables and in the let rule. In the variable rule, we're saying that x, we can establish that x is of type t in a context gamma if x of type t is in the context gamma, according to these membership rules that I've previously mentioned. And in a let, and here we're making the decision now in, in the type rule, basically, that, that our let is for the moment not recursive, um, because we're saying um, E1 is supposed to have the type T1 in the context gamma without the X in it, in the, in sort of in the outer context. But when we check E2, Right, then we extend the context and add x of type t1 there. And t1 is the type, right? This is sort of, again, the equality, the implicit equality. Um, t1 is the type that e1 has, right? And this is actually still okay from an algorithmic viewpoint. We don't have to do any clever guessing, right? Because we have this property at the moment that the types of everything can be read off and let is non-recursive. So we can simply infer the type of E1 trivially to be T1 and then we can use that as the type to extend the context with. So it's not, we don't have to do anything clever. We don't need an explicit type annotation on the X. It still remains very simple to implement this. Right. Evaluation is also simple in principle. 
right? If we don't have a rule for variables, and actually, I mean, we have, again, we have a lot of freedom, right? If we want to do efficient evaluation, um, we probably, uh, like, sort of in an implementation, would never do something like substitution. That is uh, something that is, uh, is generally uh, not a good idea. I mean, so, so certainly not substitution as a process that traverses the entire expression and, and does something. Um, but, um, but rather also store sort of mappings in some sort of environment. Um, but sort of it's quite nice not to need environments on the evaluation level. So, um, so here we're going to like take an approach which follows the sort of the semantics as you as you write it in the in in, in the rules relatively closely. So we basically just say that. <clears throat> And that is still not concretely defined, but um, that if we have let x equals e1 and e2, then we're going to evaluate e2, but all the occurrences of x are going to be replaced by e1. Right? So this is sort of uh, like some notion of substitution. Substitution is something which has hundreds of different notations in the literature. Right, really, I, I, I think that like every author is, is, is uh, writing this differently. I kind of like this maps to notation because it makes it relatively clear what is what. So a very common notation for substitution is, is to, do, um, to write something like E and then X um, sort of divided by Y, right? And, and really, literally, there are authors that are using this as meaning x is substituted by y, and other authors that meaning use this meaning y is substituted by x. Right? And I, I, <laughs> I really dislike it for that. Whereas I think if you write an arrow, it's relatively clear what you mean. Okay? But also some people are using round parentheses, and some people are writing it in front of the expression rather than after the expression. And I, um, I probably don't remember all the little variations. So substitution is one of the, the worst things when it comes to sort of notational diversity. <laughs> uh, you have to, you have to uh, really um, get familiar with what the, what the particular author you're reading is, is using. Um, Okay, um, and the implementation on and, and even the semantics of substitution is also rather tricky, right? So we have all these things with name capture that come. So if we consider something like a term like this, right? Let x equals f in if x then y l successor of z, right? So this mentions um, y, right? And then we want we want to we want to substitute y by successor of x, but, but if we want to substitute y by successor of x on the outside, then x probably has some other meaning on the outside. So and now if we simply replace y with successor of x, then suddenly the x that appears in, like, as a substitution for y is captured by this let x. And that can change the meaning of the program totally, right? So if we if we let such name captures happen, so we have to um, we have to really uh, um, uh, be careful not just to naively substitute names. And this name capture stuff is is, uh, is something like in this particular case, it would not even be a type correct thing anymore, right? Um, so um, because x um, uh, x is bound to f. And um, then out on the outside, x is hopefully a natural number, but um, but now it, it's suddenly a boolean. So um, so this is um, th this is sort of just an example of the stuff that can happen. But fortunately, right in principle, in theory, we can always do something that's called alpha renaming, right? And we can always avoid name capture by consistently renaming. So we can say, oh well, if there is an x occurring in our sort of right-hand side of the substitution, like successor of x, and, um, and the x also plays a role in our, in our expression that we're substituting into, then we simply rename the x in the sub uh, expression that we're substituting into into something else, like x prime. And if we do that consistently, that doesn't change the meaning, and then we can do the substitution and everything is, is, is done. Right? And this is sort of the stuff that is relatively easy to hand wave in a paper, 
and basically that's what nearly all papers are doing. They're just saying, yeah, yeah, pay attention that you don't do name capture. And it's really horrible to deal with in an implementation where you actually have to be careful about all these things, right? So, so that's something where a lot of of pain and complexity is typically hidden. I mean, it's fair. I mean, I'm not complaining. I mean, the, the papers shouldn't deal with it because it's not. It, this is nothing new, and it's ultimately well understood. And but it is something where you have to be aware of that if there are all sort of all sorts of forms of complicated substitutions, uh, and you are saying, oh well, it's just half a page of type rules. Let's quickly implement this. Then it's probably not going to be quite as easy as it looks. Um, so you have to be a, um, a bit more. Careful. Careful, right? And then a substitution, right? What what does it in principle mean? The interesting cases are really just for variables and let. So if you have a variable and you substitute it with an expression, you get the expression. If you have another variable that is not the variable you're substituting, you leave it alone. And then you have to be careful that if you're that you're basically just implementing the shadowing, right? So if you have let x equals e1 and e2 and you're substituting x, then the x that you're substituting is not going to be the one that, because we're binding a new thing that has the same name, so we're simply leaving the expression alone. And uh, only if the y is a different variable, um, we're going to do the substitution. And then this, this harmless sounding side condition, the y should not be free in e, Right, that basically means um, do that, that. Essentially, means something like oh, do sufficient alpha renaming to establish this. Right, to do this sort of renaming of variables so that this name capture situation cannot arise. And that, as I said, this is very harmless to write. Or some people are even implicitly they don't even write this precondition. They just say like this is implicitly understood that you don't want this to happen. Um, but this is basically where um, where some some work is hidden. Right. And um, what does it mean to be a sort of rest? The rest of the cases is, is, is sort of uninteresting. Substitution is really just pushing through um, uh, through all the syntactic constructs, um, uh, except for variables, and let nothing is happening. And then, to be complete, you also have to define what a free variable is, right? Because we have this precondition: y should not be free in E. But the idea of a free variable is really that it's all the variables that are not bound. And I think you cannot really phrase it any simpler than that. The, like reading and understanding the rules is more complicated than just understanding this, right? I mean, all the variables in an expression that are not bound are considered to be the free uh, variables of that, of that expression. So um, basically, you're just collecting all the variables that occur in any expression. And we have only one binding construct, that's the let. And now we have to be careful again, so because our let is not recursive, so e1, all, if e1 actually mentions x, then it does not refer to the x that we're just defining, unlike in Haskell, but to some x that is further outside. So we take all the free variables of e1, right, which could contain another x, and then we take the free variables of e2 and remove the x from it, because that is bound now by the let, and then we take the union of these two, okay? So that's really just to, to make this notion of, of substitution precise. Um, so, <clears throat> so when it comes to implementing name handling, um, there are lots of different approaches and libraries, and there is an entire research field, essentially. Like there are, there are things like nominal type theory, and, um, and there are various libraries on Hackage that deal with this. There are, there are approaches such as higher order abstract syntax, parametric higher order abstract syntax, and so on and so forth. And actually, I've been spending quite a lot of time as to think about what should I do here. So certainly the straightforward approach would be to just use names and to basically just try to implement this kind of substitution. And, um, uh, and that's certainly something that you can be doing, but it is tricky to get right, right? Because you have to, um, as I said, you have to do this, avoid this name catcher, you have to do alpha renaming at the right, at the right positions, right? You can try, but that requires quite a bit of machinery and advanced thinking to, um, to sort of um, 
uniqueify all the names in advance and make sure that everything is sufficiently unique so that um, essentially name capture can never happen. Um, that is in very rough terms what GHC is using internally. As Simon briefly mentioned today, like names have a unique thing attached with them. But um, in order to get that right and maintain the right invariance at all places, that is also not entirely trivial, right? Um, then the idea of higher order abstract syntax is very elegant. You use the, the function space of the host language to express binding. So rather than writing lambda string x and then some expression that uses the variable name x, you actually write <laughs> something like have a constructor, or in our case we have let. Um, right? So rather than writing something like let x and then e1, e2, right? rather than to issues, you would actually use a function space here. And, um, and that, the beauty of that is that you can just like, use the x and it behaves exactly like you want it. I mean, x stands for the variable that you're binding in the let. And then if you substitute, you just apply, right? And for that part, it's really beautiful. But for some other things, it's very awkward again, because you then have to deal with functions. And for example, you cannot, you cannot just show such a term, right? Because it's full of functions. And that's only one example. Like whenever you have to do some sort of complicated inspection, then these things become more complicated. But higher order abstract syntax is certainly very interesting. And parametric higher order abstract syntax is a variant thereof. Um, but what do you think you see most often, and what you also see very often referred to in papers, um, and I thought that therefore it's important to mention it as well, is what's called De Bruyne in indexing. It was mentioned this morning as well in Simon's lecture. Um, and the idea of that is to get rid of names and just use numbers. Um, and, and basically to say whenever you have a binding construct, like the one on the top line, let x equals z and let y equals successor of x and x equals equals y, right? you don't actually introduce a name, you just leave that blank. I've just used this dot there as a sort of placeholder to say like we don't actually introduce a name. And whenever we mention a variable, we simply put a number that counts syntactically like which of the enclosing binders we mean. And so and in the case of successor of the first successor of X becomes, um, I, I immediately made a mistake, right? Did I? Ah, no, 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 I did not because it's not recursive. Um, so the, <laughs> yeah, so, but it's very, it's also very tricky. I mean, it's very easy to make mistakes. I don't, um, I don't claim it isn't. So, so successor of X and becomes successor of zero because like within the let binding, the Y is not yet in scope. So the first enclosing binder is, is the one that was the X, right? So that, and then, but then in X equals equals Y, Right now, the x and the y are in scope, so the zero refers to the y and the one refers to the x. And um, the good thing, the good thing about this, and really that's basically the only good thing, <laughs> is that. But it's that that's an, that's still quite a bit. Is that um, there is no such thing as alpha renaming. You never have to rename. Um, because uh, like uh, there is uh, there is only one such representation for any term. Every every term has a unique representation, and um, what what typically is sort of equality of terms, modulo renaming of bound variables, is simply syntactic equality using the bind uh, indexing, and and that is why it's so compelling, right? Because like equality of terms becomes really simple to check. What's horribly annoying about it, though, is not just that, like, uh, yeah, keeping track of this, but is that the same variable can be referred to by different numbers, right, in different places of the expression, because we see x occurs twice uh, uh, sort of in this expression as, a, as an occurrence, and one time it's referred to using zero, and one time it's referred to using one. And you do have to keep track of, this, of these numbers, and you do have to shift and rename these numbers around if you, if you, want, to, if you want to do this. So 
So this is what, what kind of complicates the, the, the implementation of, or, uh, of sort of a language with variables, right? So if we look at the Haskell expression data type, um, it's basically as before, we have two new constructs. Um, the one for let does not have a variable name, right? It just has the expression that um, like the let x equals e1 in e2, it just has these two expressions. We don't actually store the variable name. And the variable is just an integer, right? It's just a number. Or even it could use a natural number if we had a good natural number type in Haskell, right? But, um, uh, so it's supposed to always be a natural number. Um, in practice, you probably actually want, in a sort of a more usable implementation, you probably actually want to store the name in the let anyway. Do you know why? <laughs> yes? Error, yeah, yeah, or even just pretty printing. I mean, it doesn't even have to be because of an error, but it's like if you have any situation in which you want to print this term again, you probably don't want to confront the user with this sort of De Bruyne representation, right? And if you have the name stored, you can in principle recover something that is very close to the original term as you would write it by hand, right? You can, you can um, use something like this. Yes? About the previous slide, yes, sure. Um, yes, actually that is another thing that does exist to sort of rather than count from the inside up to count from the outside in. I think it's called the Brian Levels. Um, it comes, like, like all of these things, it comes with its own set of problems. Like the overall trade-off isn't better. <laughs> You might at first think that some things are getting easier, but then other things are getting harder again. Yeah, but it is something that is also uh, in existence. Yes. Um, yeah. Let's let's first go back there, and then you. So. Uh, this sub no. This is just to indicate that is a a number that like plays the role of a variable. Yeah, sorry, I, yeah. That's just so that you don't think it's actual integers that like are being compared, that we're not actually comparing one to zero for equality, but we are like comparing the variable that the number one denotes to the variable that the number zero denotes. Uh, perhaps X would have been a better subscript, I don't know, but yeah, I just didn't want to use plain number. Sorry for the confusion. Um, uh, first you now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that subterms don't have stable numberings, mm -hmm. so that reforming expressions requires renumbering. Yeah, I mean, renumbering is needed to some extent here as well, right? I mean, so yeah, you always need some form of sort of renumbering. I, um, I think, but it's very long ago. I think I actually did try to implement something using the bind levels at some point, but I don't have a good memory anymore about how painful that was. In practice, the Brian indexing, like, like sort of from, from the inside out, seems to be far more common, but, uh, but it is something that does exist and is used in some places. I mean, I've certainly seen it before. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yes? Yeah, I was confused by this as well, but let me just repeat again. At the moment, our let is non-recursive, and that means, that means that while we're defining what Y should be, Y is not yet in scope, so the only binder that is to the outside of the zero is the other let, right? If our let was recursive, like it is in Haskell, then whatever we're currently newly defining is in scope in both the first and the second sub-expression, and then we would have to use a one there. Does that make it clear? No, I mean, we have to, we have to take 
care that we are implementing this consistently <laughs> everywhere, right? But the, but the point is at the moment, if you ask yourself, like, if like the whole expression to the outside of the whole expression, let's assume there are n further variables in scope, right? Then how many variables are in scope, like, at the place of the z? Well, that's still n. And at the place of the successor of zero, it's n plus one. So we only have one more, which is the, which is the first let. And in, at the place of the one equals zero, it's two, right? Um, so does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Yes? Um, I, so the question is sort of like, yeah, about the term higher order abstract syntax. I mean, I'm not ruling out that there are different uses of the term or that even like what I'm using is to some extent controversial, but I have not seen it used in any other way as to mean like using the function space to represent constructs in your abstract syntax tree. So that like that is to me what higher order abstract syntax means that you are using functions like sort of like higher or typed terms in order to represent parts of your syntax tree and binders and I think in practice um, and that may be what you're saying about the Brown indices you're often using these things together. I think people who are using higher order abstract syntax, they're still perhaps also using the Brown indices because, as I said, some things become very simple with higher order abstract syntax, like substitution. Other things become very um, difficult. So then you can actually say, okay, let's use both representations and convert between them as needed so that everything what we want to do is always um, simple in the representation that we're just using. So, um, so that is something that I've certainly seen. But, um, but apart from that, I, 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 for example, I have never heard anyone re refer to a De Bruyne index syntax as higher order abstract syntax if there weren't any function spaces involved. But, um, yeah? So, so I think the question is, can you convert easily between higher order abstract syntax and other things because uh, like functions like can contain arbitrary executable code? This is like actually this is a good point. I mean, I, it leads a little bit astray, but that's fine. Um, it's one of the things that is sort of difficult about higher order syntax is that they allow what's, what's often called exotic terms. Like the function space of the host language is actually far too powerful, right? So you're, you're supposed, if you're doing something like, let me go to my code window again. If I want to represent something like let x equals, like say, successor of um, x, in x plus x, right? Then I would write this as, I don't know, let, let me do this all in comments, and then I would write this as something like let x, like doing something like successor of x in add x, x, right? And that's fine, but this is a very specific form of function body, right? Where I'm not doing any computation whatsoever, I'm just using other constructors. But what if I suddenly started to do something like, oh well, let's, if, if even x, then I'm going to do this, and otherwise I'm going to give a completely different expression back, right? And that's what's called an exotic term, and you basically don't want to have them, right? And um, so what, what you're basically doing by convention is you're, you're just saying, you're maintaining the invariant that your code does never produce exotic terms, 
Right? And if you're making that assumption, then you can relatively easily convert one way or the other. But it is for, that is one of the reasons why there is also this thing that is called parametric higher order abstract syntax. Uh, There's one of the reasons there is another as well, but um, because it basically rules out um, exotic terms by, by like doing an extra trick. But um, yeah. Um, but I think it leads a little bit too far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any? Okay. All right. So, I, I mean, I think in terms of progressing through, right? I mean, there are basically at this point, I, I, I really appreciate all the questions and I want to take the time to answer the questions. But at this point, there are basically only two options, right? Either I completely switch mode and I rush through the rest, <laughs> or I'll just go as far as we get and stop there. And I'm in preference of the latter, because I think like, if I switch and start rushing, it's probably going to be exhausting, and I'll lose some, and, um, and the others will probably, I don't know, the others that I won't lose will also have the ability to work through the rest of the materials on their own. So I think it's probably best to just accept that we won't get to the end. Um, but then we've at least sort of covered um, the things um, at sort of like, yeah, answering all the questions, and then I can also continue answering questions, and I think that's, I think that's the best option, unless you want to strongly convince me of the other. Is there anyone who wants to strongly convince me of the other? <laughs> no, okay. All right. So here's our um, expressions, right? So, <clears throat> so if we want to implement this De Bruyne um, stuff, right, um, we need to always keep track of how many binders we're under, right? When we, when we want to substitute um, using the Brian indices, we have to renumber certain things, and we have to keep track how many binders we're under. So it's really helpful to define a function that basically just does a traversal over the tree and takes an argument, var, which which tells us what to do in the variable case, which is usually the interesting case, right? That's uh, the first argument to this function. And otherwise, just maintain sort of how many binders we're going under. So if you look at this traversal, it's actually pretty straightforward. This go function is initialized with zero, right? And we're producing an expression of exactly the same shape, right? If goes to if, equal goes to equal, t goes to t, and so on and so forth. And we're calling go recursively at every point, right, with the same i, except where we go under a binder in the let. And there, again, because we are non-recursive at the moment, we don't increment the, the i for the, for the left expression, but we do increment it for the right expression, right? So it's just a traversal which keeps track of how many binders we are under. And then in the variable case, we're calling this argument function, which gets the two pieces of information, like how many binders are we under, that's the i, and what's the variable we're actually referring to. And now we can choose what to do in that situation. And now if we have this, and we want to implement substitution, so the form of substitution that we on the outside always need, right? that is what arises if we, if we look back at the let rule, We always want to substitute, like if we call this from the outside, we always want to substitute the outermost variable, the variable that sort of on the outer level is referred to as zero, right? So in, in E2, right, where we substitute the x for E1, like if we don't go underneath any new binders, then x is referred to by, by the number zero at that point. So that's always sort of our starting point for substitution. Right? But then if we go under other binders, then the variable that, then, then the variable that we want to substitute um, increases. Right? So for every binder, it increases. So when we actually hit a variable, so if we substitute, like, um, and this, this means E1 for the outermost variable in E2, right? then if we hit the var, var case, the, we really have to compare how many binders did we go under, that's the I, and what's the variable we're currently referring to? And if they're exactly equal, then it means 
this is the variable that we want to substitute, and then we have to, in principle, insert E1, right? And then if I is less than J, right? then it means it's one of the other free variables in the expression um, that are in the expression that like, leads to further outside, but we are, we've been substituting one of them, so we have to decrement it by one because that, that one is gone. Right? And if i is greater than j, then it means it's some sort of like, variable that, that refers to something that is internal to this expression e2 that we're traversing, and that number should not change. And this is really tricky, right? And I don't claim that it is easy, but if you think it through, it does, it does kind of make sense. And there is an additional complication, and that is that we have to adjust all the numbers in E1. <laughs> right? And why is that? Because E1 itself can refer to variables, but we've now been going under I new binders, so all these numbers have to be incremented by I. And that's what shift does. And that's the reason why I implemented db, because shift can also be implemented in terms of db, but only the point is where if we shift by n, we basically want to imp uh, increment all the variables by n, again, except for the variables that are sort of local to, to that expression. That are true, and, and that's, the, that's the case distinction here. Those are left alone. So this, is really, this part is really tricky, right? And, um, but as I said, all the other name handling things also have tricky aspects. There are some libraries, such as Unbound, Bound, uh, there are a couple of others as well, I forget all the names on Hackage, that claim to make this easier, and they do. Right, so they do in the sense that they, um, they take some of the tricky code that you otherwise have to write away from you, but at the price of writing other boilerplate code in order to instantiate a library and understand exactly what it is doing. So um, for this presentation, I decided against using any of these libraries because rather than sort of explaining the, the sort of universally applicable concept of the Brian indices and their complications, I would then be explaining to you the, the implementation peculiarities of one specific Haskell library, which is uh, less universal knowledge. But in principle, right, there are libraries out there that you can use that sort of have the promise that um, rather than writing this sort of boilerplate code, which is very, very tricky, you have to write other boilerplate code. You still have to write boilerplate code, but that is less tricky, <laughs> right? So, um, and that's, that's a good trade-off in, in principle, right? So you, you, um, you still have to instantiate the library and set the things right, but then hopefully there is less chance to make mistakes, right? Um, okay, but this is the hard part, right? The subs and the shift. And now everything becomes easy. So I'll actually skip over this example. Um, or oh, well, perhaps not. I mean, so if we... This was the previously problematic example that I showed with the name capture. And if we just assume that the sort of... The outside X has some number, 42, just like a randomly picked number that is bound on the outside far further, far further out, and we're substituting var 42 for in, in this expression, which in the Brian indexing should look like this, right? Then we do get something, and now the 42 has been incremented to 43, and it's still referring to the outside um, variable, right? Because it's been moving under one binder, this let, this new let for the new x. Um, but that's, um, uh, that's fine. Okay. Um, right, so <clears throat> the rest is actually not so hard. So eval um, uh, of a variable itself, like if we hit a plain variable, we're now implementing things by substitution. That means we should never actually hit a variable that doesn't have a meaning. Right, so variables should always be substituted out before we hit them. If we actually arrive at a variable during evaluation, something on, has gone wrong. We have a scope incorrect and therefore also type incorrect uh, expression. And in the let case, we simply substitute. Right. Um, if we want to implement environments um, in this 
context of the Brian indexing, that's actually very nice because it's just positional, right? So our De Bruyne index are, is always just saying, like, how many binders do we want to look up? So we essentially really just have to carry around a list. We don't even have to worry about names anymore. We just have to carry around a list of types. And, and basically, that's what env is. It's just sort of a, a snock list, and, uh, a list that grows to the right, and just to keep it closer to the, to the uh, rule-based presentation. I have chosen to not use a normal Haskell list, but a list that um, extends to the right. So empty is like the empty list, and extend is something that like, appends a single element to, to a list in the end, right? A, a new type. And then we have a lookup function that um, is basically implemented just like a normal lookup function on lists. It's like an indexing into a list, but one that doesn't crash, but produces a maybe. Okay. And then uh, implementing the type rules is actually not surprising at all now, with all the hard work being done. So variable, we simply do the lookup. Right, that, that translates the, the element of. That's the algorithmic reading of the, of the element of precondition. And, um, and in the let case, we are inferring the type of E1, and we are then extending the environment with this type T1, and then we're inferring the type of E2, and that is the result type. So everything works out. And the other cases are basically just passing on the environment. Right? I mean, the only thing that changes to the previous version there is that they pass on the environment, but they don't do anything with it. Okay. Um, any questions? All right. So let's briefly, before we just run out of time and I stop, let's briefly recap where we are. So we have been, and actually the, the step, like the first version was very, very difficult in the sense that we had to establish all the ground rules, but apart from that it wasn't. The second step I think is actually the most tricky one, apart perhaps from the final, the version 5, because it does all this name handling stuff. Versions 3 and 4 are actually pretty simple in comparison. Um, all that version 3 now does is it's adding two new constructs, lambda abstraction and application. Right? But they don't really add anything that is new and hard. So lambda abstraction has all the, the, is another binding construct, but we have already seen a binding construct in the case of let. So it's not going to, to do anything new that is uh, difficult. Recursion is perhaps a little bit tricky, but it's also comparatively simple. So let's see. I think version 3 we can probably still cover, and perhaps even parts of version 4, because I'm expecting this to be like really now, these are comparatively simple steps, right? So if we want to like have proper functions in our language, right, then um, we need to add abstraction and application. So lambda abstraction and application. Like you, that's the syntax. And our type language gets a new construct, because we now have function types. So we no longer have just natural numbers and booleans, but we have function types. The rules, the application rule, I think, is pretty simple. Right? If we have a function application then of E1 to E2, then E1 should better have a function type right? of T1 to T2. And E2 should have a matching argument type. And here we have this sort of implicit equality again, right? Like before, right? But it's all a concept that we know now, right? So basically, um, here we have to have a, like need an equality check on the type somewhere to make sure that these, these two are really the same. And then the result type of the function type that, that, that E1 has, has to match the result type of the application. The lambda rule is a little bit more interesting. Because if we have lambda x arrow e, then it should have a function type as a result, t1 arrow t2. And when does it have a function type as a result? Well, if we extend gamma with this like, new variable x that we're binding in the lambda of type t1, then e should be of type t2. But there's something strange about this rule. A little bit strange. It's not. It's actually an okay rule, 
But do you see what's strange about it? Compared to all the other rules that we've been seeing before? Sorry, who's, who's speaking? Ah. <laughs> Yeah, okay, there's a function arrow in the type language which we just added, but that in itself is not really a problem, yes? I think the difference is that we are implementing That we're adding, we're increasing some, but we've done that on the let already, right? We've been extending the environment already, but it has something to do with extending the environment. Yeah, it has to do something with the T1. It has to do something with the T1. Where is the T1 coming from, right? So again, like this is fine because the type rules exist sort of without an algorithm. Actually, you can write a type system that doesn't have an implementation, right? Where it's basically completely infeasible to give an implementation. But the point is, if you want to like have a sort of an inference reading like we did so far, where we basically said checking is just we get a type, but the, the way that checking is implemented for us was always like we just read off the type and then we check that the type that we want is the same as the type that we read off. So if you're now assuming we want to infer the type of lambda x arrow e, then we have to make up the T1 out of thin air. We have to like we have to conjure that up. And this is really this is the point which I mentioned initially, where we get this branching between like so far type inference was basically for free, right? But now we have to make a decision. Do we want type inference? And then we probably want to be able to write something like that and have the compiler or the implementation figure it out which type it is. Or do we want to like help the type system, right? And so if you want to do type inference, then the way that you're doing this at this point algorithmically is to say, okay, I'd have to guess the T1. So you're introducing some sort of meta variable for the T1. And then further down, if you're in your algorithm, you're learning something about it. You're collecting constraints, and then you're realizing the constraints, and then you're unifying um, the sort of the, the, the type that you figured out with the constraints. And then the end, you hope that you've learned something. And that is, like, I mean, obviously there's a lot of detail, but that is sort of at the at the essence of what what type inference systems like uh, Hindley, Damas, Milner, and what what GHC is using and variants of how they work, right? So you in, whenever there is a sort of point where you have to guess, you, you introduce, you don't make an assumption, you, you just introduce some meta variable that stands for the type, and then you hope that over time you discover some pieces of information of that type, and then you try to realize all these pieces of information and hope that they're consistent with each other, and if you find an inconsistency, you report it as a type error. Right, but that's not something that we're going to do. We're going to take the route that um, GHC also takes internally in its in its core language, right? Um, to say we can avoid this problem of guessing by just adding explicit type annotations for all the binders, and we didn't need that for the non-recursive let because the non-recursive let has an expression already directly attached to it that we can use to read off the type. And if we have this property that we can trivially read off the type of all the expressions, then for a non-recursive let, we don't really need that. But for a lambda, we do. Because for a lambda, we don't have an argument to apply the, the lambda to close by. It can appear very far apart. right? So we really only have the x, and so we have to annotate it. And for a recursive let, we also would have to. right? So, yeah. Yes, but even if we were to look inside the E, that is sort of a start of what type inference then would be doing, right? We would then start of, I mean, in, in, it's not a problem really if the X does not occur in the E, right? Then in principle, it doesn't matter what type we're assuming for the X, right? So then we can, we could argue, we don't have a form of polymorphism yet, but in principle, we could just argue that it can be any type and it, it will always succeed. Um, 
But if we start looking inside the E and how the X is used, that, then we are getting into the realm of like exactly what type inference is doing. Then we're first assuming some sort of meta variable. We're traversing into the E. The moment the X is being used there, we're doing some unifications. And in the end, we hopefully get some information out. Right? But the easy way is to essentially just like that's what we are doing here to just say, okay, we can avoid all these problems if we simply annotate the X with a type and we require that whenever we do a lambda abstraction, we have an explicit type annotation. And that is common in explicitly typed languages and it's like sort of GHC's core language is, a, is an example, but other kinds of intermediate languages, I mean, Simon was saying uh, this morning, it's very uncommon for a compiler intermediate language to be typed and I think he's right. But nevertheless, there are some examples of typed, explicitly typed languages, and some of them have also the role of, uh, mo they more often have the role of intermediate languages than user languages, right? Languages which, which are generated from somewhere, because a user can usually not be bothered to write out all this type information, that's very annoying, but if you're generating the code in the first place and you have that information around, then, um, then that is feasible, and it certainly has the advantage of making sort of the, the type system implement implementation much easier, right? Um, so um, so this, is, this is what we're doing. And then the evaluation rules are very simple, right? Um, so if we have, this is a small step now, if we have something that's already a lambda and we apply it, then we simply reduce it to a let. I mean, this is, like, I could also reduce it to a substitution, but this is really... Um, the same thing, like the let then reduces to a substitution, right? This, this is essentially what captures beta, beta reduction, right? And um, uh, in, in lambda calculus. And, and if we have an application where the function is not yet in the form of a lambda, we reduce the function in the hope that we, that we get to a lambda. Okay, and then the implementation is, there is actually, I think, there's really not very much here. So lambda is, is getting the type annotation, not the name, and the expression application is two expressions. We have the new function types. We have a new weak head normal form of functions because lambda terms, they don't, like we only reduce up to the point where we have a lambda and we don't look at the body of the lambda. And then evaluation, an application is, um, Oh, here I did not actually, I should have written using, using let as well. Here I'm, here I'm using the substitution. So that's a little bit inconsistent. But yeah, I mean, I could have just called um, eval on the, on the let um, rather than on the subst to make it sort of consistent with what the, uh, what the semantics are saying. But, but it's, it's amounting to the same thing, right? We're expecting that the, uh, the, the function thing evaluates to a lambda term. We don't care about the type annotation for evaluation. And, uh, and then we just um, do the substitution or the let. And the lambda is already in weak head normal form, so nothing happens there. The De Bruyne traversal, so this is the nice thing of abstracting out the De Bruyne traversal uh, because we have both um, substitution and shift. We only need to add these two new cases to the, to the go function of the De Bruyne traversal, um, the actual substitution and the actual shift function don't change at all, right? But we do increment the level by one because the lambda is also a binder. And then inference is, yeah, basically just, I mean, this, I think this is hopefully unsurprising at this point. There's nothing, there's nothing new there, right? And I think this is actually a, like sort of a good, a good point to come to the conclusion and rather sort of give a little bit of an outlook um, than to, to really try to do new things. What we now have, right, um, is essentially an extension of what's called the simply typed lambda calculus. Right? Um, the simply typed lambda calculus in its core shape is as listed here. So you really just have variables, lambda abstraction and application and most of the time, I think people are adding let as well, because sort of it's convenient to define lambda in terms of let and so on. But you will find representations where, like, if you're really purist, 
I think it's really just variables, lambda, and application, right? Um, and then you have a type system where the essence is to have function types, and then you probably need to have one base type at least to have um, to have some sort of some grounding for the functions. But the point is that the simply typed lambda calculus is in essence is a is a framework, right? You're you're nearly always looking at extensions of the simply typed lambda calculus. We also have an extension because we have added natural numbers and we have added booleans and so on and so forth. But um, but this is sort of the essence of what's called the simply typed lambda calculus, and that is. Um, sort of yeah a, a very nice point in the in the design space right so what's missing now and that's basically versions 4 and 5 and I'm not going to do them anymore is recursion right that's very important in practice we need at least some po some kind of recursion. We don't necessarily need general recursion but the the thing is if you look at our real language let's actually briefly go to the code and look at version 3 and see what we have. Right, so we have natural numbers and we have booleans. Let's actually make this a bit larger. We have natural numbers and we have booleans. And for booleans, we have something which is called an eliminator often, like the if then else, which is a satisfactory way to deal with booleans, actually. Right, the only thing that booleans operationally encode is the, the option to make a case distinction between two different branches. But for numbers, we don't have anything satisfactory. We cannot, we cannot write addition, we cannot write subtraction, we cannot write multiplication, because we have no way to perform some form of induction on these numbers. So that's the least thing we need, right? So you can either add some induction principle on natural numbers specifically, and that has the advantage that it actually keeps the language terminating, Right, um, that's good. Or you can add a form of general recursion in, in the form of either a recursive let or a fix. And, um, and that's the path that I'm taking in version four of the presentation. So I'm adding let rec, um, which is a recursive let. Uh, you can then define fix in terms of let rec. Uh, many papers are also adding fix instead, and then you can define let rec in terms of fix. But recursive let is, I think, the sort of more, more easily understood and less theoretical concept, because that's basically just let as you have it in Haskell, right? Uh, where um, you can use the variable you're just defining already. That's, um, and that adds general recursion. And then you still need some sort of like construct to uh, case, may do a case distinction on natural numbers, but then you don't need an induction principle, then a normal case is enough because you have recursion separately. So you can basically just add um, a case, uh, like sort of a specialized pattern matching construct on, on natural numbers. That is, um, where is it in the, on the slides? That is just looking like this case, like case and expression is either zero or a successor of something. So you don't have sort of a general language of patterns, no deeply nested patterns. It's really just specialized to, to natural numbers, but you can branch between the case where a natural number is zero and the case where a natural number is a successor. And then you're at a point where you can write interesting programs, right? With system F and a data type where you have some sort of uh, induction principle, you can, write interesting, you can write interesting programs. And then the final step is to go to system F. And system F is basically adding recursion, uh, sorry, not uh, adding polymorphism. And that is, but fortunately, um, something that Simon has already done this morning, so I don't really, <laughs> so that fits nicely, right? Um, so then you get these big lambdas, um, uh, so they, uh, like you can abstract over types in order to introduce polymorphic things, and you can instantiate types, and that is version five of the language. And then if you wanted to go beyond that, Right, then the next thing, the next natural step would be something which is called F omega, which GHC actually also has, where you say um, you also have um, function kinds, right? So, so in, um, like even in system F, you don't really have a kind system yet. But in Haskell, you know, you can abstract over not just um, types, but you can abstract over type constructors as well. Like, for example, the functor type class is parameterized over, over things like list or maybe, rather than over things like int or bool, so over type constructors. And so giving 
having type variables that range over uh, over parameterized types that is a, that's a powerful feature and that's sort of what distinguishes system f from system f omega and um, and the, in, the, in, the curious feature of system f omega is that it's sort of the kind language together with the type language are more or less like the simply typed lambda calculus again and that's something that you often see is sort of like the next more complicated system is just moving more features from that you already have on the on the expression level up to the type level and you can play that game further and if you move everything up and basically say you collapse it all to the same thing then you get dependent types right and that's also very fun but as, as I said, the, the big problem that starts when you start getting to dependent types is that the question of type, type equality becomes much more complicated. Because so far, whenever we needed to establish type equality, we really just needed to compare for equality. And even in system F and in system F omega, it's essentially still that. You have substitution on types, but when you need to check for equality, it's still just equality. But the moment you go to something like dependent types, or even some sort of semi-dependent types like you have in Haskell with type families and um, type level computation, you suddenly, whenever you need to compare types, you also have to reduce them to some, you have to reduce the types to some normal form or unify the types or, or do something more complicated at least. And it's not quite so easy anymore to say when two types are equal. Okay. Um, yeah, so sorry for not getting to the end. I'm happy to answer more questions, although perhaps not like because I think there is... When's the next thing starting? In half an hour, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, so perhaps not on the stage, but offline, I'm certainly happy to answer more questions. And... Um, yeah, and, uh, and then the rest of the slides and the, all the code samples and potential exercises to work through are, um, are in the repository. And um, you can also ask more questions on the, on the Discord channel, and I'll try to monitor that. Thank you very much for being here so long. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Andreas. Um, yeah, uh, our next session will be at 5. Um, see you then. Thank you. <laughs>